Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by The Trek. Today is August 28th, National Crackers Over the Keyboard Day. What does that mean? It's a good question. I don't have an answer for you, but that's what it is. What do you think that means? Um, just taking it purely literally, people who are masochists and eat crackers while leaning over their keyboard. Like, that's a really good way to just get the micro crumbs into your keyboard, and you're never getting that out. So I think this is a holiday invented by big what's the air compressor thing that like cleans your keyboard oh, the blowy air yeah stuff. i think they invented this holiday knowing that this is how they're going to keep themselves in business it's not like maybe it's, maybe it's related. code for it could be a piano yeah cracker has a lot of meanings yeah i want one over your keyboard <laughs> i am your co-host did we do that part yet I'm your i co- don't know I'm, I'm zach davis yeah i'm trans <laughs> Um, reminders of any kind, we are releasing a book at some point, and this is going to hinge on you guys. Mm -hmm. If you've got a standout pooping in the wood story, we would love to showcase your glory for all to enjoy. We are currently collecting submissions, which will be available through the link in the show notes. Um, Chance, what am I missing? Um, this, if you want the full context of it, listen to the last episode. We went into how this is an April Fool's joke turned bad, um, but also good because... We might soon be the poop authors who also have a podcast. Like, this might be the thing that we're known as. We might be the shittiest authors in America. That's my goal. Um, possibly the world. Yeah. So, we want your poop stories. We want the most wild, wackadoo, crazy pooping in the wood stories you have we're gonna share ours uh lord knows i have enough um, i heard one story of uh someone was backpacking and their dog jumped into their feces and then jumped onto that person and, and smeared, rubbed it all yeah, over them yeah. yeah that one uh one of mine it will oh, be yeah. in there and then another of mine um probably i don't know how on my birthday on trail a adult man walked up on me as i was pooping and Me in panic mode um, continued to poop because I figured that was the best way to handle it. Uh, If I stood up, he would have seen my vagina. And so you got to cut your losses somewhere. So just all kinds of stories like that where, um, you know, you go to poop, things don't go to plan. It is humorous for other people to read. We think this would be either a great coffee table book or... Like, my mom always used to have a basket in our bathroom, and she would switch out the books in the basket seasonally um, to kind of, like, fit the mood and holiday. Um, So maybe while you're taking, you know, a nice long break from your kids um, while locked in the bathroom, you can have this book there to help guide you along your journey. Yeah, I I believe that laughter is a good way to... um force out a good bowel movement so yes. this is for your own health and if you ever think like you're having a hard time in there you just flip the page and you see someone who's having it worse for sure yes the other reminder is if you guys want even more backpacker radio content please consider supporting us on patreon chance is currently leaving the studio we release a q a episode specific for our patreon listeners on the first wednesday of each month august's episode was i probably the most fun we've had doing one of these i would say like we smiled in the same room together more than we have like not that we don't like each other but we were having fun we were we were giggly for yeah sure. we were yeah the energy was there um it all stemmed around zach getting high which was fun i asked him some riveting questions to try to mess with him such as what jobs don't you think women should have mm. um and stoned zach rose to the occasion yeah Sure did. Honesty is the best policy. (laughs) Uh, But I think we got confirmation from the rest of the team that it was adequately silly. Sarah said she had a good time putting the clips together. Yeah. So uh, if you guys want to hear more of us, and totally understand if you don't, because, damn, the only reason I tune into the podcast is to hear our guests. We're a lot. But um, there are a few weirdos out there that want more of that. Um, And this is the way you can get it. Also, it's a good way to put money into our beer fund, which is... uh, an important ingredient in the show. Actually, today's beer fund is supplied by our guest, and let's get right to it. This is a uh, from Moab. Is the Grand the name of the brewer? Moab. Moab Brewery. Oh. The Grand is the name of the beer, yeah. which is an uh, Imperial Pilsner. Sweet. Well, we're joined by Sarah Tidewalker Liebold. 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 Shit. 
<laughs> who is a writer, video blogger, focusing on human-powered solo budget and low-impact travel. Sarah has over 10,000 human-powered miles under her belt, including 6,000-plus miles hiked, 2,500-plus miles rolled, and 1,500 miles plus biked across both the country and the world. Most recently, Sarah completed the Hey Duke, and she is a writer for The Trek. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us here at Backpacker Radio. Yay! Let's start off with the trail name, because I don't think I know this story, Tidewalker. Oh, yeah. What's the origin story there? I gave it to myself. Okay. You're <laughs> Bef- in good company here. Before the AT, okay. my AT hike, because I didn't want a stupid one. <laughs> And I'm from Alabama, went to the University of Alabama, which is known as the Crimson Tide, and thus Tide Walker. It's not anything special. (laughs) It did get shortened to Tide. My hiking partners started calling me Tide. Mm. And then once I got out of the South, people didn't get the Alabama connotation. And so it was like, are you from the, the beach or do you have clean clothes? You know? Yeah. I did think it had to do with the rowing. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, here's an oddball follow-up question. I want to know about your master's thesis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, about the Arizona Trail. So it was inspired by, I'm just in my apartment looking at the Arizona Trail map. And I was like, oh, man, if I could write my thesis about the Arizona Trail or have some connection to through hiking, that would be amazing because you're supposed to write, you know, something that you're really passionate about and that's going to sustain you to write for, you know, a year in research and stuff. And so I got the idea to, to hike the trail and interview people that I met. Um, but then I realized that I wouldn't be able to start hiking until after the semester ended in May. And that's not the Arizona trail season (laughs) to hike. And so I was like, Oh, I'll just mountain bike it instead. I'll be able to go faster. And, and so for some reason, that's the idea I had. And then obviously like didn't meet anybody and then found out that I'm not a very good mountain biker. (laughs) (laughs) And there's a lot of like detours for the, the bike route, uh, um, compared to the hiking route. And, um, And so then afterward, I just had to find hikers through a different way. But I wanted to focus on relationship with nature and environmental behavior. And it was just um, using through hikers as a case study Mm. for for that. Why the Arizona Trail besides just obviously having looked at the map? Because I feel like there's a lot of, like, writings done on relationships with nature, especially in the Northeast. Um, what drew you to Arizona for this? Well, I was in grad school in Flagstaff, Arizona. Oh, so okay. that's why. <laughs> cool. I was just, yeah, I was at Northern Arizona University. And my master's program was pretty interdisciplinary, uh, sustainable communities program. And, um, yeah, so I learned about the Arizona Trail when I was living in Flagstaff. Didn't know about it beforehand. Because um, at that point, I had, you know, just hiked the Appalachian Trail a few years before. Um, and then, yeah, I just wanted to do something involved with the trail and then was inspired about, um, environmental behavior just because like the changes that happened to me, you know, my experience on the AT, I just wanted to use through hikers as that case group Mm. to study. And were there any takeaways from this? That's what I was going to (laughs) ask. Um, I mean, it's, it's basically what I was expecting was that. Um, I think through hikers are probably more inclined to have, you know, more positive environmental behavior, like, um, you know, public transportation, like, you know, personal environmental behavior, you know. And did you get a sense for the cause and the effect? Like, are people that are more drawn to nature more likely to through hike? Or is it that once they start through hiking, they are, they find that uh, infatuation with nature? Yeah, I was interested in the whole relationship with nature aspect because I was thinking just like and coming from the sustainable communities program we were learning about so much about social environmental justice issues and um, thinking about all the the bad things that are going on in the world right and it's like I believe it's because of people's disconnect from their life source from from nature and so I figured hikers and through hikers probably have, that's a way to 
reconnect right with mm-hmm. nature and have that much time in nature yeah Were you, you, does that make mine's sense? gonna be a tangent you go <laughs> Um, okay, I'll take it because I think that this is interesting and something we haven't really t- chatted about yeah. and relevant to what you just said. Because I know in your intro, we touched on the low impact travel. Mm. So is that something that stemmed from your master's? Um, I feel like I was always very into environmentalism and just reducing my own impact. But in, in grad school, like I definitely learned so much more and and that maybe it's not the best to just look at our own personal use because it's like it's more of you know corporations and policies <laughs> like sure. um i think a lot of people get bogged down with like oh what am you know what am i doing that you know has an impact but really it's if we all join together <laughs> and like make change with policies and pressure corporations like that's where the the change mm-hmm. And with the low impact travel, is there a loose definition for what that looks like? Because I know, um, I'm sure different backpackers have different ideas of what that might entail. Do you have a rough gauge for what that should look like? Um, I mean, like driving is less impactful than flying, <laughs> you know, when you're thinking like fossil fuel wise. Um, I mean, I mentioned that I'm out of like a minivan camper van and I just put a solar panel on it. Like I'm not really connected to a grid, you know, I'm basically off grid, um, being able to power fridge from sun, like impact that way is what I'm thinking. Okay. Is that what you're. Yeah. That answers. (laughs) I didn't have a preconceived notion for what that was. So yeah, just lowering your impact in in general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't, I guess my question was more so geared toward, if there's a style of whether it be through hiking or doing these bike packing trips or rowing, if there's styles that are more low impact versus other ways. Interesting. Of yeah. I haven't thought about that. I think, I think all human powered travels probably similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tangent us, please. <laughs> oh, um, well I was going to, when we were talking about like sustainability and, um, people who hike having a stronger connection to nature and that sort of thing i was going to ask if when you did this thesis you had pulled any inspiration from people like benton mckay like i feel like having done the at he was doing a lot of that regional planning with sustainability were there any like different people on the trail that you had drawn from for that no not really i didn't think of that connection i was i think some points that i touched on was just like indigenous people's um view I don't know if there was like someone similar of the A- like the AZT. No, oh, I didn't think about that. Okay. Okay, so just to set the stage here for all of your experience, if you could do us a favor and run through your resume without any added context, just like y- this year I did this, this year I did this, this year I did this, and then we're gonna go down some of these rabbit holes. We, we wanna go deeper on some of these things, preferably uh, you know, adventures that we haven't covered in great depth on the podcast before. Um, But I think just for listeners to know all the insane journeys that you've been on, it'd be good to hear it straight from you. So not just hiking. Everything. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I started my first through hike on the Appalachian trail in 2011. Um, Then drink. Yeah. (laughs) We just had someone write it and say, and they were so glad we hadn't said that. Yes. It has kind of died off. Dedicated to you, sir. Yeah. Um, Kayaked some on the Swanee River in 2013, biked the Natchez Trace in 2015, was a ridge runner on the Appalachian Trail in 2016, then through hiked the Long Trail in 2016, did the Camino Frances in 2017, the Annapurna Circuit 2018. <laughs> I have a list because I had to write this down. <laughs> yeah, I have a list too and you've already missed a couple, which is just yeah. impressive for, I, I see uh, Kat Mai National oh, Park well, Packer. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. We'll skip that one. <laughs> sure. Okay. <yeah. laughs> um, and then then the notches tray notches trace through bike. Yeah. That one. Yeah, that was in 2015, and then um, let's see, Mississippi River Source to Sea in 2018. I did 100 miles on the Camino Portuguese with my mom in 2019. Biked around Netherlands, Belgium that summer. Um, 
then through hike the Pinhoti Trail in 2020, section hike the Bitten Mackay 2020-21, went back on the Appalachian Trail as a ridge runner in Shenandoah for 2021, and then Arizona Trail 2022. <laughs> um, I did a bike trip last year on the Great Allegheny Passage and the CNO from Pittsburgh to D.C., and then um, then the Hey Duke this spring. It's a good list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that's probably it. <laughs> yeah. We've obviously talked a ton about the AT yeah, yeah. on this podcast, but I'd be remiss to not know what your inspiration was to get involved in through hiking. The origin story is very important. Yeah. I mean, and that was my first backpacking trip ever. <laughs> like I had, you know hiked and camped before but had never backpacked before but i think yeah sometime in high school just heard about the at and what was your start I'm, date april 2nd okay i think yeah. and you finished when august 7th oh hey you i were finished fast. august 7th really yeah oh my god finish <laughs> so wins we did wow, it's august now conceivably <laughs> cross paths at some point which is funny to yeah because i started march 21st right. ended march 22nd or august 22nd That'd be a pretty fast hike if I can yeah, do it in a day. Yeah, really fast. Uh, so, yeah, we crossed paths at some point. At some point. Presumably. I mean, I I did keep in my journal, like, a list of everybody's trail name that I met. And so after, like, I read to see if your name was in there, and it wasn't. Uh, so I probably didn't meet you, sure. actually. But I did jump off it. trail a few times, yeah. so I guess anything is possible, too. Yeah, Zach the Yellow Blaze the whole AT. <laughs> actually, yeah, I, I was. Did you I drove like it, it very slowly um, just to prove that it can be done at a through hiking speed. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, okay, so sorry, we derailed you as we do. AT 2011, first backpacking trip of any yep. kind. What what even put the AT on your map? Yeah, I think I just heard about it in in high school. A uh, teacher's son was doing it, and I'm from Alabama, from the South, and so like the Smokies are pretty close to me. And but I don't think I'd really heard about it before that, and then just put it on my list of something to do. I like being outside and. I like challenges and I was an athlete in college and I'm like, I, I think I can do this. <laughs> and so. obviously so, cause what is that four months you did it in yep. for your first backpacking trip is very fast for people that are not familiar. The average is somewhere between five and six months and to do it in four as your first through hike is. Well, and I credit that to my hiking partners. They were pretty quick. Uh -huh. So, and I wanted to hang out with them. So <laughs> you look tall too. How tall are you? Yeah, I'm tall. Five <laughs> eleven. Yeah, you're tall. What's I'm not that fast though. Like I'm I'm I feel like I'm fairly slow. Did you have a pretty light pack? As no. at least by twenty eleven <laughs> standards, like I know the UL thing wasn't popular on the scene at that point. I don't think so. Mm. I don't know. What was the response to doing the AT in twenty eleven? Because it was definitely less popular then than it is today. Yeah, I mean I don't think anybody really knew about it. I mean, I remember telling pe my friends in college, like, I was like, when I'm done, when I graduate, I'm going to hike the AT and I'm going to shave my head. Like, that's what I told all my friends. And, and I did. You shaved your head? <laughs> yeah, I buzzed it. That's fun. Before. Because, like, yeah, I just knew that for hygiene wise, like I wasn't going to be taking a shower that often for ticks. That was kind of a big thing was like, oh, I'll be able to see ticks on my head or, More aerodynamic. <laughs> or something. And then, yeah, just like to be able to like clean myself easier and and for heat, like yeah. just having long hair. Like I don't see how people do it. <laughs> nuts. I, I also buzz my head before the AT. We might be the same person, uh, <laughs> but primarily just because I wanted to see the the evolution of my face. Yeah. I shaved my beard once throughout, okay. but I, I let my hair continue to grow. And I thought it was just funny to look at like clean shaven, bald Zach. And then by the end, I looked like a swamp creature. Um, yeah. D did you let your hair continue to grow throughout the hike or did yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, my hiking partners kind of joked because I, I wore a hat m most of the time. And when my hair grew out, I had these little, little flippies that would come out. Ah, like a skater boy. It was pretty cute. I think. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> Um, any standout moments from the AT? Any big life revelations? Poop stories. Poop stories. Animal encounters. Near death experiences. Poop stories. Friendly, fun rainbows. No, I mean the highlight was my hiking partners that I met. Like I started by myself and met them, 
we started hiking from Damascus on. We called ourselves Dumbledore's Army. That was Ooh. that was like before people said Trail Family, and so it was just like these were my hiking partners, and we were Harry Potter fans, and so that's what we called ourselves. Very cool. How, how big was your group? Oh, it was just uh, me, Shayla, and Steven. Just Got three it. of us. Got it. Former guest of the podcast, yep. Shayla. Kiddo. That's right. Um, yeah, I guess if that's it for the AT, we can move on. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> So tell us about the river kayak trip with your pop. Oh, the Swanee River. Um, yeah, so he actually had a, cause I want to do everything like human powered. So I kayaked, but he had this contraption where he put two canoes together and with a little trolling motor. Um, <laughs> and that worked out pretty well. Is like had an engineer by chance? No, just like didn't want to work, Yeah, <laughs> you know, fair. just like just rode along and, um, and the Swanee was pretty special because they have these like wild free wilderness camps along the way that you can stay at, like structures and, and things. Hmm. I don't know if it's like that now. It's been 10 years now since I've done it, but. Were um, they like AT shelters or what kind of structures? No, they were, they were like four. Well, I think the walls were mesh or something. Um, I could like hang my hammock inside. Um, and they would have like trolleys t to take you from like the river up to the camp and to carry all your stuff because my dad had the trolley motor so he had all these batteries <laughs> mm. <laughs> and it weighed a lot so would you say your sport was in college road road okay Rowing. so this translated quite nicely to this adventure well that's why i wanted to row the mississippi was yeah the college experience probably why her so. dad needed the motor yeah keep just up. to keep up for sure um so for those who are not familiar i know only because i looked it up but tell us about the swanee river um, I don't really remember that much about it. Um, from, I think, yeah, you could get on in Georgia, like Southern Georgia through Florida. I think we just did a hundred mile stretch. I think we wanted to go further, but my dad was kind of having issues with the, the batteries, keeping mm. them charged <laughs> while we were on the way. Yeah. But. What was it like going from your first adventure being like the solo through hiking experience to then doing something with your dad? Like, was that a pretty radical departure? Not really. I mean, ever since, I mean, my dad's one of my best support systems. Like he comes out to a lot of my hikes and mm. road supports me or my bike trips that he does that. So I feel really lucky to have that and to, you know, cause my parents aren't super active. And so if there's any way that I can, get them to go outside with me you know and the fact that he was able to just like chill in the canoe you know and not have to paddle or anything like that was the way to do it yeah did maybe you said this but did you do the full i think two, 246 miles to the gulf oh on the mississippi on the swanee oh no okay no what part did you do um i've got a map yeah open. i don't even rem i don't even remember how long it is <laughs> i think we just did a, a short section 100 miles i think oh nice yeah. okay and then how did you plan for it like when i think about rivers i'm always kind of worried about what if there's rapids all of a sudden how do you plan for a trip like that to know that it's going to be okay with for example two canoes tied together with a motor <laughs> i mean i'm yeah that's a good question <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember if uh, if i planned much for that one um i think my dad was familiar with that river just because he'd been probably in that neck of the woods before um i don't think there's was any rapids or anything to worry about nice. there's other gators what sort of wildlife? there there were alligators that was probably the the only thing yeah. i i remember seeing some gators for sure yeah <laughs> they didn't attack you that's good no um, okay. I also, we just briefly, I want to know about this cause we've talked about it in the through hiking context, but the Notches Trace through bike 2015, Yeah, that's a shorter trail, right? Yeah. So that's a national scenic trail, um, 440 miles and being from Alabama, that's close to me. So it goes depending on where you're, you're starting Tennessee, Alabama and Mississippi. Um, and it's a parkway, like 45 mile an hour parkway hmm. and I was just like, oh, I'll just, I'll bike it <laughs> instead of walk it. I mean, I don't know why you would want to walk that. <laughs> That's what I've heard from people who've walked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it I is. mean, and it and it's fairly flat, so it's like pretty easy biking too. Yeah. And um, yeah, just like cultural significance uh, for the Native Americans in that area, um, mounds and, and things. 
how long did that one take you? Um, I think it was like eight days, like very chill, yeah. like not very fast or anything. And my dad like road supported me, so I didn't carry anything. Yeah. <laughs> I was just on my road bike. So we're still early on in the resume and so far you've hiked basically at a running speed. You've done <laughs> rowing and uh, now on the bike, you must, are you a good swimmer? Do you just crush on triathlons? No. <laughs> no. Does rowing and swimming not translate? I know obviously totally different, but. Yeah. No, I've, I've only done like one little sprint triathlon, but okay. I like swimming, but that's not really. Maybe I should get into it. <laughs> I just, yeah. If you, you can do your first through hike of the AT in four months, I imagine you're just good at this stuff. Well, I was young. <laughs> yeah. We were young. So, and, go ahead. I was going to say, having gone from through hiking to the rowing trip to through biking trip, it kind of seems like you're dabbling in all these different ways that you can do this low impact travel. Is that going through your mind at the moment? Or are you just like, someone who has a couple different interests and you're trying to satisfy each of them. What's your thought process going into these in terms of how am I going to use what method of travel to get through it? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just after hiking the AT, you just you learned about all the other trails to do. And then it's like, well, I don't have to just hike, you know, I, I enjoy biking and, and I like rivers. And so I like to compile all of those together and, it just depends on the trail and and what I want to do. Like, I like the idea of kind of doing a hike and then a bike and then a river trip and then, like, a, a cycle in that way, but it doesn't always work that way. Mm. Yeah, in terms of a cycle, I mean, you – so that was right before you went back to the AT as a ridge runner. So what mm -hmm. brought you back to the trail? Yeah, I wanted to give back to the trail because um, as a through hiker, I definitely felt like I wasn't grateful enough. <laughs> um or even understood really like the depth of how much work goes into maintaining the trail. And, you know, I just wanted to be back on the trail. I wanted to give back. And that was the way I saw me being able to do that. And that first season, um, I was in Northern Virginia from like Shenandoah to Harper's Ferry, the roller coaster section. So not, not like the easiest section. <laughs> um, and, I definitely got burnt out <laughs> doing that for a whole summer. Like the other seasons I worked as a Ridge Runner was in Shenandoah just for a month. And that was perfect. Mm. Like Shenandoah Ridge Running is like VIP Ridge Running, in my opinion. <laughs> That's interesting because I would think that would be the most challenging part just from the standpoint of you get so many just day hikers and just the average folk that – I feel like through hikers at that point are pretty dialed in. They're probably And that's not, what I like. Yeah, right. <laughs> that I don't have to deal with. Like I I would not want to be a ridge runner in Georgia with That deal, sounds hard too. You know, that sounds really difficult. Yeah. I mean, just really having to help educate and Yeah. newbies and not knowing how to poop right. and all sorts of stuff. And so by the time that they got to me in Northern Virginia, it was like I didn't really have to you know tell them what what not to do sure. you know it was more of just like i'm out there to help and but i would imagine fresh. that the weekend warriors don't know that stuff and you're gonna see that right in shenandoah did, yeah did you encounter that situation pretty often um yeah yeah and day hikers and and i enjoyed that because i mean my favorite part was just being at a shelter like having dinner at the table with all the hikers and you just kind of come into conversation naturally naturally about what I'm doing out there and usually ends up talking about the privy and picking up trash and that was the way I felt like I was able to make an impact for people instead of having to be like oh no you can't do that you know or you know it was more of like if I told them oh I actually have to pick up all this trash in this fire pit if people live this here like if they actually saw someone do that then maybe they wouldn't be as inclined to to do that because they're like oh there's actually a face to someone that has to deal with this. Yeah. A lot of people who listen to this podcast are either someone who's done a hike or they're planning for one. So let's say we get someone listening who's planning for the AT for 2024. What kinds of things would you expect you'd have to tell them as a Ridge Runner in Georgia that would be something that you wouldn't want to be a Ridge Runner in Georgia yeah. for? But what kind of crash course stuff could you give them? listening to this episode for before they even get on trail? 
I think the major part is going to the bathroom um, in the woods. like And not properly <laughs> digging a cat hole or like what specifically? Yeah, yeah, the cat hole situation. Um, I mean, I felt pretty lucky in Shenandoah. We have the composting toilets in Northern Virginia. We did not. And I'm having to knock the cone in the privies. Define knock, knock the, cone. the cone. It's yeah. exactly what you think. <laughs> The cone, the mound that forms under the toilet seat. Yeah. And so I get a stick and just knock it, <laughs> make it flat. Yeah. You know. <laughs> what does that do? Just so it evens out the poop. So the so the summit doesn't exceed Touch. the yeah. toilet space. I'm asking for that. I understand. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. I was just uh, putting it. In. So I, your poop I, doesn't touch their poop when it's coming out right. of your butt. Right, yeah. Could you gross or not gross? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is that smell experience like? As she barfs. Yeah, I think she just gagged. <laughs> um, not great. Not yeah. great. It's not great. Is, is that the worst part um, of the job? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, sometimes you'll come up to some rogue poops, you know, that you'll mm. have to bury. Luckily, I didn't really have to do that as much. Um, but when I would be out with... Um, my supervisor, the coordinator, uh, he would always find something mm. to have to bury. He had a bloodhound's nose for <laughs> I, rogue I guess, dumps. I guess. Yeah. Have you ever gotten someone's poop on you? No. In Shenandoah, <laughs> in Shenandoah, we had gloves. That was a major up, upgrade. In North, Northern Virginia, it was just like, I literally would go out and find a stick Yeah. and just like knock it down. In Shenandoah, they have by the composting toilets, they have these boxes um, that have like a dedicated shit stick yeah, <laughs> and gloves and like cleaner that I could actually clean the seats with. What do you do with the poop stick that you find after you're done sticking it in poop? Yeah, you hit you, the bad hikers you just, with it. You uh, <laughs> just chuck it, chuck it back in the woods. <laughs> yeah. What? I, but in Shenandoah, like the, the shit stick, like, you put it back in the box and it sits in like this yeah. pot that doesn't touch anything else. I feel like a shit stick is a pretty common insult and now it's actually been given meaning. I thought it was always just one of those things where you just combine two words. Yeah, but you're a useful tool. You're, yeah, you're, you're, you're <laughs> a helpful aspect to society. Yeah. I mean, it's probably not like the the real name for it. Yeah. I don't know what it's. Shit stick is some, perfect. Some kind of pick. Yeah. Thing. I don't know. Be a good trail I, name. Should Should sick. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that the turnover rate is pretty high for ridge for, running because yeah. I and from what I know the pay is not awesome, and if that's part of the job role, I could see like doing that at not, not an awesome pay rate yeah. being a challenging thing. I mean, and that's why I really loved my gig in Shenandoah, just being there for a month. I the other my co ridge runner in Shenandoah has like a l- much longer season, um, but I was only there for a month, so I. I felt like I wasn't going to get burnt out. I wasn't going to like get tired of hikers or just even tired of the trail. Mm -hmm. Like in Northern Virginia, I was there for a full season and I was out for 10 days at a time. So 10 days on four days off. And that was actually pretty rough and being on trail that much. And then I'd be picking up trash and there's just not as many places to drop off that trash. And so I would be hauling bags of trash for days <laughs> before I could find a place to to deposit it. Whereas in Shenandoah, there's so many places that, you know, you can bathrooms and waysides that you can drop it off at. Yeah. And I would get rides from the Rangers, you know, in Shenandoah, like I'd park at the end of my five days and then the Ranger would take me to the start and then I hike back to my car. Mm. Um, so that's why Shenandoah was, was great. Yeah. <laughs> How often did you encounter human to bear encounters in the Shenandoah section? Surprisingly, not. I think in the last few years, um, there's really hasn't been that many bears in mm. Shenandoah. Like on my AT hike, I never saw any bears in Shenandoah in, tw- really? in 2011. Mm. I didn't see bears until New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, and then working in Shenandoah in 2021, didn't see a bear at all. And then last year, I saw one bear on my very last day. Hmm. Do you think people are better about 
like not getting the bears habituated or do you think the bear population is just getting lower i think the bear population got lower i don't know there might have been some kind of disease or something <laughs> that was hap- i don't know yeah because that's I, I, I've been through the Shenandoah section twice, and I saw once I went through like 2011, and I only saw a cub. That was it on my first time going through, and I was under the impression that I was going to see bears left and right. That was it. And then I did that section again a handful of years later, and I think I saw in like three days probably five bears. I mm-hmm. saw a lot. So it's strange to hear that there's not that many now. Yeah. yeah. I'll toss in my one bear I saw in Shenandoah in 2019. Really? I got one. Mm. One bear sighting in Shenandoah. Yeah. Not on the trail, but in Shenandoah, I saw one. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, anything else about ridge running we should know about? Um, so it sounds kind of like hard and low paying and uh, you have to have a lot of patience for people. What are the um, redeeming qualities of being a ridge runner? Like what's your elevator pitch for someone should Ooh, give back and be a ridge runner? Good. Um, you're a part of the Appalachian Trail. Like I feel like, I mean, the trail maintenance that I've done, working with trail crews as well, like being able to help hikers, like that just makes you feel good. Um, being able to give back to something so much bigger than myself and being part of that history of the AT, which is just so iconic, you know, in the trail community um, is really special. How does someone get involved? Let's say like I'm sitting on my couch and I'm like that would be something cool. I'd like to accrue some good karma. <laughs> what are my next steps? Where do I go? I mean, the, you can apply on the ATC's website. Um, and then I think it goes out to the other, the clubs along the way. And I think when I first applied, like I just applied to the ones that had housing offered because um, I needed some place to stay. And, and now I've done... Um, Northern Virginia, Shenandoah, and then I also did Maryland last year, just like for a month. And the places that I've got to stay, it was pretty awesome. Like in Shenandoah, there's a old ranger's cabin that we can stay at. It's like totally off grid. Um, and then in Northern Virginia, you can stay at Blackburn, which is so awesome. I don't know if you stopped there on y'all's hike. I don't it's, think so. It's, um, yeah, before Harper's Ferry, it's like after Bear's Den. Um, in Blackburn, it's it's like 0. 0.3, 0. 0.4 like off the trail, and so not as many people go to that. Mm. But it's a really special place. Mm. And then in Maryland, the housing was at Washington Monument State Park. <laughs> it sounds like there. So you do this housing with the other Ridge Runners. Is it kind of like summer camp vibes? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And what is the work schedule? Now it's five days on, two days off. Okay. Back when I did it in 2016, I, I chose the 10 days on, four days off, just so I could have more time to like go have fun yeah. on my days off and go travel around. But they don't really, I don't think, do that anymore because it's so hard yeah. <laughs> to be out there for that long. And you had mentioned you did one month and then the other person you were doing it with had been doing it for the summer. What are the expectations for time like can you do it for a month or can you do it for like how long can you do it for yeah I think it depends on where you are along the trail I mean you know Georgia's gonna start in February probably the ridge running in Maine you know they probably start much later I don't really know much outside of the mid-Atlantic region because I was was with the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club that's that section I was in um but for Northern Virginia, it was Memorial Day to Labor Day was the season. And then I think Maryland, they started a little bit earlier, probably maybe April to the end of October. It's a pretty long season. Just because they have Annapolis Rocks there in, in Maryland. And that's probably one of the most visited parts on the trail. Like you get so many people out there because it's so close to DC. And part of being a ridge runner in Maryland was you were a caretaker at Annapolis Rocks. So you just kind of stay put there and talk to the people that come there for the day or to camp there for the night. But it's so highly visited at Annapolis Rocks. Yeah. Last ridge running question for me. Do you guys have any like insider terms or nicknames or things that you give to like a typical kind of 
like the hiker that doesn't bury their poop or the one that listens to music on the Bluetooth. Like, do you have any fun little what insider are the ridge runner things? For yeah. The common Tell folk. us all your dirty secrets. No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we did keep track. Like I have to file reports mostly about like blowdowns and the reports that I make at the end of my run will go out to the trail maintainers, to the trail clubs. And so a lot of it is documenting, you know, trail maintenance issues. Um, but I would keep records of how many day hikers and backpackers and through hikers I, I meet and I kept like, tallies and stuff, but I don't, I don't think we had names for anybody. It was just like, this is a day hiker, you know, and you don't always have to ask, you know, you, you can tell yeah. <laughs> who's a backpacker, who's a through hiker just by the smell. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. And if you guys want to hear more on ridge running, we actually go pretty deep on that episode 169 with Kylie Yang. She did the New Jersey section, so mm. a different perspective. I imagine if you talk to ridge runners in every state, you get a very different perspective. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so Camino Frances, we touched on that pretty deeply in a recent episode, so we'll oh, okay. hit the skip button there, unless there's anything that you absolutely want to get out to the listeners of the... I mean, I highly recommend it. It's great. <laughs> I wanted to do it more for the cultural reason and um, for the food. <laughs> Good reason. Ch- churros and sangria. Like yeah. that's why I would go back. Are you vegan? <laughs> no. Okay, then give me the non-vegan take because that was the one thing that we didn't get in the previous mm. episode. Oh. What like what was the best culinary mm. experience? Um. Yeah. I mean, the pilgrims' menus are just so awesome because back when I did it, it was like 10 euros and you get wine and you get bread and you get a first course and a second course and a dessert for 10 euros. Like that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, this deal. is the most convincing to me. <laughs> I can do this with my I'm, family. I can I get can Jenna. Go, I'm a, <laughs> I could go to the Florida trail and get eaten by an alligator yeah. or I could go s- s- waltz along the Camino. Yeah. And so I think the, um, booze and probably other extracurriculars are pretty cheap in Florida as well. Yeah, they're also going to be the reason I get eaten because yeah. I'm going to be frolicking through Look at this lizard. knee-deep ah, water, ah, yeah. not paying attention. Yeah. I mean, it was a whole thing to search out churros. Yeah, I love that. Every day. That's very like, that was Churros con chocolate. Like, that was the thing. And I wrote an article for the trek about all the food along the Camino. Oh, man, I must have missed that we one. We got to tag that. <laughs> yeah. um, or more likely, I just forgot about it. Okay got me excited for got me more excited for the Camino which is yeah. on the ever growing bucket list um, another thing we've talked about a lot of the podcast so I just if, if there's something that stands out here that you want to talk about let us know the Annapurna circuit in 2018 yeah beautiful um, again didn't really have much way to like research that so I just watched YouTube videos um, there's no like guidebook or anything so I just flew into Kat, Kathmandu, <laughs> you know, and um, got sick. <laughs> Is that like a rite of passage? Using a squat toilet, which was not fun. <laughs> mm. Enlighten us I, on the squat toilet. Yeah. How does that work? It's just a hole in the ground Kay. and you just squat. Yeah. And yeah, there's like Thailand. a, yeah, in Thailand. Yeah. So yeah. you have a little, a bucket of water that you like, you know, rinse off with mm. and thing. It's dirty. I didn't like it. Yeah, if you've got a real swamp foot situation, it seems like you're going to need a big bucket of water. It's not like it's it's cleaner than you think. It's just it's like you're pooping outside, but everything is like man-made around you, like the floor and the walls. Yeah. It's it's different. It's yeah. an experience. Okay. What was bringing you overseas at this time? Cuz you did all these like US excursions and then all of a sudden you get the Camino and then we get the Annapurna circuit. Is there something that's making you want to go try things overseas or, you know, anything relevant there? Yeah, I just, I like to travel in general and go everywhere and was felt pulled to go to Nepal and and hike those big mountains over there. And Sure. So the typical trajectory after the AT, assuming you're still enthralled by the adventure world is AT, PCT, mm-hmm. or maybe if you're going to do like, if you have less time, you'll do the Colorado trail or whatever it might be. Did you feel that pull at all? Or you wanted to go more off the beaten path? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I never really, and this was back before like triple crown was like so much of a thing. Um, and I 
didn't really have a desire to do the CDT. Like I always wanted to do the PCT for sure. Like I always felt drawn to the Pacific Northwest and having been from the South, I hadn't had that much time there. I did live in Oregon for like a minute, but I never felt so much of a desire to do a triple crown. And I felt like, I, yeah, I kept putting the PCT off and now it's been so long and it's like, oh man, I, it's just so many other things have come up, you know, going back to grad school and having a job in Alaska and having summers for like, since I work seasonally, that's usually the time that I make money is in the summers. And so it just never really worked out for me to get back to the PCT and to hike that. Mm. That was going to be something I slipped in at some point as a tangent, but how are you making this happen? Because I think that's something that people struggle with is how to like keep up with this level of travel and be able to afford to do so. Mm. So for you, it's seasonal work. Yeah. I mean, I've been living this non-traditional lifestyle since college. So living in Flagstaff for grad school for two years has been the longest that I've been anywhere um, in like 12 years or so. Um, and it's just the lifestyle that I've been making up as I go. Um, haven't really had not following any path, right? Like, and this is just what I chose to do. This is what makes me happy and I've just been making it up as I go. And it just, yeah, make some money, go on hikes, go travel abroad and see what happens. <laughs> Did you ever have doubts following that path when there's like, it's not the stereotypical traditional like way of life? Because I know that was something that I started feeling doing the PCT and then going into the AT and each time you want to do something next, but then it's how far from the, you know, traditional way do I want to stray? What was it like for you making that decision? Yeah, I feel like since I've been doing this so long, I've definitely, that was a struggle at first and comparing myself to my peers and what they were achieving and what I call like the traditional indicators of success. And it was like, you know, they're getting married, they're having babies, they're, you know, they have a career, they have a house. And I did not have any of that. And I didn't necessarily want any of that. And so I had to just stop comparing myself to them. And that was a struggle at the beginning, but now it's like, we just want different things. And so it's not a comparison anymore. Um, I'm sure you've got friends that look at your life and are jealous of the path that you've taken. Exactly. And I, yeah, it's always grass is greener, grass is greener. And there's totally sacrifices too. Like it's this lifestyle is very difficult. (laughs) Um, And I do feel like I've sacrificed a lot. Like I don't have a partner. I don't have like a stable group of friends. I mean, I have friends everywhere. And I'm always visiting them, but I don't have that like one tight knit group, you know, and I don't have a home base. Like I go back to my parents every so often and that's the home. But do you have any tips or advice for someone who's still in the comparison phase, but wants to get to the, this isn't a comparison. This is just who I am. Like acceptance phase. Yeah, I think it's just about realizing that you want different things. Um, My friends that, and it's not that I don't want to be married, like, sure, (laughs) you know, or, or kids, you know, or a house or career. I mean, I knew I didn't want to have a career like that was for sure. I I didn't really want to do that. Um, I feel like I am not going to feel content in that way but it's just yeah knowing that you want different things and removing yourself from like what society is always telling you that you're supposed to have and that's what's hard living in outside of like long trails right it's it's easy to do that when you're hiking because you're removed from all all of that but then when you're back, it's like, oh, no, society's telling you that you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to have that. And that's when it's difficult, right? <laughs> do you feel like you have to wring the rag of adventure and get it out of your system and then settle into that type of lifestyle? Or do you foresee yourself living this way? Yeah, I don't really like that idea of settling. 
right? Like that word settle. Yeah. I mean, maybe compromise is the more accurate word. Why do I have to compromise? <laughs> well, because you were saying that there is yeah. a, there's a trade-off, right? Like trying to find like a right. consistent partner when you're always on the go or having a family. Like those are the things that you're trading off. So, mm-hmm. um, you I mean, know. I hit it's, that when I was on the AT where it was like, I feel like there's two paths in front of me. Like especially with all the stuff, the podcast and like social media gives you for opportunities that I, at least I saw for myself, it was, I could really keep going with this and I could keep doing this stuff and keep doing these hikes. But I also like, you know, the flowery side of me wants the white picket fence and wants, you know, the house and the family and all that. And I, I felt like on the final month or two of the AT, I was going through the thought process of, I can choose to go down one of these two paths and it's going to start to close the door for the other one, at least for the immediate future. And that certainly felt like something that I had to like sit with my thoughts on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's all about what you prioritize, but you already said like to choose one of each path. Whereas I feel like I'm not choosing either path. Like I'm just bushwhacking out there. (laughs) Like I'm just making it up as I go. Like, I don't know what next year is going to look like. I don't know what the rest of this year is going to look like. Um, Yeah. I feel like you have to be very comfortable with yourself to be able to do that. Because for me, my anxiety would be absolutely through the roof, skyrocketed. I think that's a good observation. Yeah, I definitely am confident and have had enough time in solitude and by myself to reflect on all that. But it's... Yeah, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it had to do with, like, getting that independence doing college sports or having your dad there with you on some of these earlier trips to kind of, you know, I don't know. I Like, I, w- I would think there's maybe some part of, like, upbringing or something that gives you that confidence and that independence and that self-assurance to be able to do something that so many other people struggle with. I don't know. I just feel like I've always been like that. <laughs> cool. I, I like the, I that like was this our segment topic. On, uh, yeah, yeah I, like, I was going to say this is our segment advice. on introspection. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's really important. And I think, honestly, that's why a lot of people get off of trails and quit because they're not okay with spending that much time in their head and then by themselves. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I don't know how you view your adventure resume, but for my money this is the headline event is the mississippi river source to sea row mm-hmm. would you agree with that it's my least favorite <laughs> okay let's start there yeah. why it's my least favorite because it was not fun really <laughs> it was not enjoyable why? start to finish just misery yeah. or what yeah i mean being i mean i was by myself and as opposed to like the AT, the camaraderie is what like helps you get through it, right? Like being able to have that family that you're going to at the shelter every night and talking about your day and things like that. And out on the river, I'm just by myself and I'm not able to vent to anybody, you know, be like, oh man, this sucks. Like today was really hard, you know? And that right fish. (laughs) And that was just like all on me. And then just like the pain of it. Um, So I was in a canoe that I put a rowing insert in. And so I'm rowing backwards. I have a little rear view mirror that I'm using to, to mm. be able to see. So I'm not having to turn around as much, but the, the rowing seat slides. So that's how it works. And it's, Is that so you can generate more force. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I know nothing about water sports. So yeah. So that's like it. traditional rowing. So that's what I did in, in college in the, the long boats where you have your coxswain and then your eight rowers. Um, but in the canoe, it's not the same shape as these racing skulls and stuff, but I was still going backwards and the seat itself was just like very hard and it was very painful. Like I was thinking I'm going to be able to do really big days. And when I first learned about, oh, that people go down the Mississippi river, when I was on the ATM, met someone who had kayaked it and I was like, okay, this is going on the list to do. And then I was like, well, I'm not going to kayak it. I'll just row it because I'll be able to go faster and further and thinking I was going to do these big days. But the pain, like my butt pain, was a major hindrance in me being able to do a lot of miles. 
more dumb questions. Can you just get a seat pad? I, I, was gonna I had like five. Uh. <laughs> like at, by the end, I was wearing bike shorts and I had like two pads to sit on. But it just, I don't know. I don't know if it's like just the, the movement because you're like rotating, you know, your hips and stuff over and over again. I don't know if that's different than just sitting still like you would be paddling in the canoe. Mm. You know, is it similar to what you were doing in college? Like, is just for longer durations it yeah. gets more painful? Ex- yeah, exactly. Okay. So, well, that was the the main reason why yeah. <laughs> it was not enjoyable was the pain and being by myself. Um, is very difficult to like find places to camp. Um, you think you're on the water, it's hot, you're going to be able to go in the the river, but you don't go in the Mississippi River. Like, it's not nice. Like, it's gross. Like, all the cities, you know, along the riverbanks, like, dump their stuff in there. Mm. And so when it's, when I feel like my head's boiling from the sun and I'm so hot and it's like, all you want to do is, like, get in the water and cool down. It's like, you don't because it's so gross, mm. <laughs> you know? Are there stretches of the river where the water is a little bit more pristine or is it just throughout? I mean, at the very beginning. So yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, so in, at Lake Itasca, I started in a kayak because it's like, you know, as wide as this table. Mm-hmm. And um, once a, hun- a, a hundred couple miles, a hundred, couple hundred miles in, it gets wide enough that I was able to put the canoe in um, to row because the oars are pretty wide. Um, and then that section is nice probably from the start to minneapolis and that's when you hit the first lock and dam and then from there i went through 26 or so lock and dams that i had to go through (laughs) how do you manage that yeah so like and you know all the barges are going through there as well and so i think some people carry a marine radio that you could call the the lock and tell them you're coming or whatever but i did not have a marine radio so i would row up to this big concrete wall and there would be (laughs) knock there would be like this rope that you would pull and it would sound an alarm or a horn or something and the lock master obviously would probably look out his window like i don't see anybody so he'd have to come over and see oh there's a canoe down here and you'd be like i need to lock through and so then they do whatever they need to do and then they open the gates they have like lights like a green light and so you roll row in they close the gates. You hold on to a rope on the side of the wall. And sometimes they, they're not even lowering the water that much. Um, it could, they might not even lower it at all, you know, depending on where you are. I think the biggest was in Minneapolis where it was like probably 20 feet or so that you were lowering. Um, and then they'll open the gates and give you the green light to go through. But there would be times where I would get stuck behind a barge and the barge takes an hour and a half to go through. And then I would just be sitting there waiting for the barge to go through. Tell him to throw me a beer. Mm. Um, is it making like rapidy wave? What, what's my thing with rapids? Is it making <laughs> rapids when you're coming out of it? Like when they're releasing the water? Because I know they time certain things like on the Nanahala, they time when they open mm-hmm. the water to make the rapids. Like, I mean, A, electricity, but also for the outdoor center, for people to do the white water stuff. Is it creating, like, some fun stuff for you? Not really. I think, so, the Mississippi is so wide that the lock and dam is really only, or the lock part is really only a small section of the river, and the rest of it is, like, the spillway. Uh, So it's not, like, the major, like, dam release that you would see on, like, a whitewater river. It's like the elevator next to the stairs. Sure. Okay. Was any of this type two fun? Like, do you look back on any aspect of it fondly being like, (laughs) you know what? That wasn't so bad. Or is this just pure type three? I mean, yeah. And that's, that's the thing. Cause it's like, I don't quit things and it's like, yeah, I got to a certain point where I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, this is not enjoyable, but I'm like, well, I don't quit things. I'm going to finish what I started. Um, obviously like looking back, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did it. You learn from all those experiences and even, pushing through those kind of experiences is where the growth is. And so I'm glad I did it. And now everybody I tell, I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. There's better rivers. Yeah. Like there's other rivers I would rather, rather do. What are the safety aspects of it? Cause a lot of big cities are, you know, 
planted along the Mississippi. So are you feeling safe as you're camping at night or is being so close to cities sketchy? What's it like? I mean, you really don't see the cities. I mean, going through St. Louis, um, that's was the last lock and dam. And then from there, camping was much easier. And so I would actually be able to camp on these islands in the river. And so like, I'm not even on the sides of the, the river to where like other people could get to me at. So I was just on my own private island. I mean, going through New Orleans was probably the, you know, the biggest city. Um, but I, m- my dad had come down at that point and I remember we locked my canoe to a tree <laughs> for the night and then like, you know, went to go to a hotel. And then I feel like I told one of my friends who lives down there and she was like, what do you, what do you mean? You, it's not going to be there, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, oh, that'd be fine. Who's going to take <laughs> a canoe? <laughs> like, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I left my, the rowing insert in there because that thing was heavy in itself. Um, and to have to take that apart was like a whole thing, but it was there the next day. <laughs> it was fine. But it's gotta be cool to row through New Orleans, right? Maybe this is just, yeah, I mean, that was definitely cool, but the closer I got, I think it got really windy and that was really hard to like have the headwind to row against, um, when the river gets wider. And then I was having like major like ships, like cargo ships kind of coming by me, which hmm. was a trip. <laughs> Yeah, are they... I mean, I I couldn't... I mean, the river's so wide, right? Like, I'm not rowing in the middle of the river. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sticking very close to the banks. And basically, like, in eddies the whole way. So it's, there's hardly any current. And that's why it was not great either. Mm. Because b- when barges would go by, I felt like they were pushing me close to the, to the, the banks. And I was not happy with the barges yeah. either. I would cuss them as they went by. <laughs> How long did it take you? Uh, I think that was like 70, 75 days. And I stopped in the middle of to go do a job and then came back. Was that always part of the plan or was that impromptu? That or? was a, a spontaneous thing too. Yeah. yeah. Like a, a job that I felt like was a, a great opportunity to do. Where was this and what was the job? Well, this is the job I'm going to in New York okay. to work at the U.S. Open tennis Ooh, tournament. Nice. That yeah. is a fun one. Yeah. Are you a ball girl? <laughs> No. <laughs> what do you do for the U.S. Open? Well, it's funny because I work for ESPN. Oh, sweet. As a runner, and so when I tell people that, they think that it's the the ball. Yeah. People. As a runner. Yeah. It's just like a show a production assistant. Ah, yeah. It's I was like very about bottom, sport. like operations, um, setting up the office space for ESPN staff and getting people food and things. But it's really fun, hmm. exciting. What's atmosphere. the what's the oddest request of an ESPN personality? You don't have to mention oh. any names. But. No, I mean I don't I don't work with the talent. The talent, yeah, they the runners that work with them, yeah, it's they're going all over the place mm. and working late. How'd you fall into that gig? I met someone on the Camino that hired me for that job See, <laughs> they and, they say, and they say people who do long distance trails like they mess up their resume right. you've heard that yeah. too right no i mean you go out there and meet people they'll give you a job at espn that's the best part of like this lifestyle is the connections that i've made and now i've gone back this will be my fifth time going back to the u.s open just because i met this one person one day on hmm. the camino and we connected have, do you have any other fun odd jobs over the course of these adventures? Oh yeah, I've had a lot. Let's talk. I, I mean, I've worked for the Forest Service here in Colorado, uh, where I, um, y'all are familiar with Devil's Head Lookout Tower. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, when I was there, I got my red card sort cert for wildland firefighting, and I went up to work at the Lookout Tower for one weekend. To back then, it was um, Bill Billy Ellis was up there uh, as the lookout and they were off away for the weekend. And so I went up there to work that for the weekend and spotted a fire, spotted hmm. a smoke. <laughs> that was really exciting. <laughs> you were the first person you discovered the fire? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's what the job is. Yeah. You're spotting smoke. Yeah. Did they a, name it for you? 
No. I would have demanded that. <laughs> no, but my, I mean, as far as I know, this was back in 2017. Like, I put my name on, like, a piece of paper on the wall in there. So if you went up there, you would, 2017, this fire that I spotted. Hmm. Did it get cool. taken care of pretty yeah, quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't very big. It was very nerve-wracking because I was like, is that is that smoke? Like, or is that just dust from the cars on the road? And I was too nervous to like call it in over the radio. So I just called dispatch like on the landline and was like, I think that this is smoke. <laughs> and I gave them like the, the coordinates or whatever. And then I heard it over the radio and they dispatched the helicopters and blah, blah, blah. And, and then soon after it was confirmed. And I was like, oh my God, thank, <laughs> thank hmm. I mean, not that it's good that there was a fire, but like, We're I'm, gonna glad, clip this part. I'm glad that I... <laughs> Yeah, imagine staring out for that long. You probably go a little bit crazy, like getting mirages and whatnot. Well, I mean, like you're not staring out like constantly, it, and you get so many people that are up there. Um, so you're talking to to the hikers and, and things, and every like 15 minutes, you kind of get your binoculars out and do like a sweep Got around. Um, I feel like I wouldn't be able to do a lot of these jobs. <laughs> like the, it reminds me when I was a lifeguard for a summer camp. Like I used to sit in that chair and just like sweat because I would be looking at like the kids in the pool and trying to decide are they playing or are they drowning? Oh, and yeah. I don't want to be the lifeguard that blows the whistle and jumps in the pool when they're just playing, but I also don't want the dead kid if they're not playing. <laughs> right. Um and that's what that's fire Twelve story kids reminds died on me. Of. Watch cuz she thought they was playing Marco so, Polo. <laughs> okay, you've done a lot of these seasonal jobs. It sounds like a lot of them are like fun and interesting and different from each other. What would you say your top three favorite seasonal jobs you've done are, and what are the low tier bottom three? Um, well, I worked in Alaska. That was probably my number one job. I worked for a bear viewing company that operated in Katmai National Park, and I that was right after. I graduated college and me and my friend road tripped from Alabama to Alaska because my boyfriend at the time was a wildland firefighter up there. And so we were going to go up there to be wildland firefighters. <laughs> but then we got up there and we got certified, but never got on an assignment or anything. And then we just wanted to hang out in this one town. She got a job at the grocery store. And then I just kind of stumbled upon this bear viewing company. And then it was such a small company. Like I ended up like living with the owner and in their house and went back there for several years after to work for them. And they had like the Disney nature bears film was filmed primarily from there. I got to meet Dr. Jane Goodall. She came out wow. to camp. like that was a big deal. So, I mean that and cat my is, was incredible. And so that's definitely my number one for sure was working in Alaska. What is the day to day of that job? Well, I was office manager, so I stayed in, in town in Homer. So I would send guests out on a small bush plane to Katmai. So Katmai, there's no roads or anything. And people are probably more familiar with Brooks Camp. That's where, like, the Fat Bear Week thing happens Ooh, when yeah, you see that. Yeah, I love Fat Bear yeah, Week. That's, <laughs> at, that's at Brooks, where the bears are fishing for the salmon in the waterfall. That's Brooks Camp in Katmai. So that's in the interior. But the company I worked for had an in holding in the park and had this part right on the coast. And so they had developed this off grid camp out there. And so the bush plane would land on the beach and people could stay overnight. Um, and we would have a lot of photographers and, and filmmakers that would go out there to film the bears um, fishing in the creek or climbing on the beach sedge grass depending on the, the season but I was I was in town so I was just sending guests out there and giving them the the spiel about bears and and things like that that's but cool I would go out at the end of the season to like take down the camp yeah did you ask for the top three or? I did oh my gosh <laughs> um way to hold her accountable Zach well, good job I'm good at numbers especially up to three I mean I'd say yeah the U.S. Open is definitely up there uh, that's really just like a month that's not that long um, do you get to attend the tournament i mean like i'm there on site i i've seen like serena like as close as i am to you hmm. like practicing like nadal you know Djokovic. like i've made eye contact with him before <laughs> it was intense <laughs> um yeah i mean like 
we don't get tickets to like watch the matches, but I mean, we're running around the whole comp, the whole site. And so you can kind of go wherever. Do you ever take any souvenirs? Oh yeah. Yeah. What kind of souvenirs have you taken? That's a good question. Yeah. So in the stadium, like they have the special drinks and stuff that the honey deuces that they make, like $30 drinks that I'm never going to buy. And, um, in like souvenir cups and stuff and people leave that all the time and so I'll go in the stadium and pick that up and that I've give those as gifts to people <laughs> <laughs> and then like just on yeah on site there's so many places where you get like free stuff and the runners like we make a whole thing of like going out there to get all the free stuff we can the sure. f- free hats and all sorts of stuff and that's gifts that I give people <laughs> yeah it's a good Christmas present yeah, yeah. <clears throat> all right number three uh, um yeah, bridge running. <laughs> I forgot about that. Safe answer. I forgot about that one. Yeah, yeah bridge running for sure. <clears throat> um, it's funny. I So I Googled the Mississippi River just on maps just to see like what cities were yeah. off of it. And <laughs> it has Google reviews. <laughs> <laughs> the Mississippi River has a four and a half star rating. <laughs> on Sweetest 23. of these reviews. Okay, that's it. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, the bald eagles are headed back north right now. You can see hundreds along the river near Al- uh, Albany and Savannah from LeClaire, blah, blah, blah. I want to find a one-star review. That's what I want. I did see loons. That was really cool. I saw pretty good wildlife up in Minnesota. Um, I'm, I'm texting the group chat that we are making a new segment, <laughs> one-star reviews, reviews of trails. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be. That's a day. good one. Uh, Riley, Gary says, too long. <laughs> 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 also, T O long doesn't support average sized. <laughs> okay. uh, C Uston says navigation by ship torment for ship's personnel. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Moore says nothing substantive here. <laughs> the establishment refers us to movies or poetry and nonsense. Uh, yeah, these are great. Just <laughs> just a bunch of mud and catfish. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. The uh, big the big muddy. Okay, wait. Before we move on from the seasonal jobs, are there any places you could point people to if they want to look into seasonal work? Specifically because I had, when I was working at the summer camps, I had someone request or recommend that I sign up for this email list. It was outdoorindustryjobs.com. Mm. And they send you, like, lists of these outdoor jobs at like bike shops or fishing places that are hiring positions in the outdoor industry and i've had thought that was the craziest thing in the world i just didn't know that existed are there places like that that you can go to to like keep in the know of all these different types of seasonal jobs that you know of i don't really use anything like that most of mine have just been because of i've met somebody like i had another job up in Killington last year because I worked with him at the U.S. Open. Ah. And, or I've worked at ski resorts for the winter, and it's just because that's where I wanted to live, you know. So I don't know any. No, talking to people is good. That's a good advice. <laughs> that's not what I would go for. But <laughs> um, okay, anything else for this Mississippi trip? I know, obviously, it wasn't your favorite, but it sounds like – character building yeah for sure um and I, I wasn't able to make it actually all the way to the gulf um so i made it to like where the last road is road access because if i had gone further i would have had to get like a boat to tow me back mm. <laughs> um so just like yeah as far as the last road went yeah which was probably maybe 20 miles or so short of the gulf why do you suspect the seating arrangements so much more uncomfortable relative to a bike in the canoe yeah, yeah i mean i have trouble on bike trips too Same. i do too <laughs> because yeah. i i don't regularly ride and so i get an idea of doing a bike trip and i'm like oh man i'm gonna go so much faster than i'm gonna hike yeah and then i'm like oh this is a brilliant idea and then day one i'm like oh my god i forgot how hard this is yeah. and painful it is <laughs> After about ninety minutes, I'm ready to never be on a bike again. Like yeah. it's limiting for me. Yeah. yeah. So. And that's usually what has happened on my bike trips. Is oh man, I should have trained, or instead of just jumping on and doing four hundred miles on a bike. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there's any value to just 
eating a shit ton of ice cream and getting a big fat ass? Because that's got to be more comfortable to sit on, right? I would assume the more milkshake you have, We'll, we'll certainly bring the boys to the yard. The boys will be in the yard, <laughs> but will yeah. you be comfortable on your bike? Yeah. Um, cool. <laughs> is there anything else from the Mississippi trip? I, I feel weird moving on from it because this is so out of the ordinary from anything that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. I guess what all is your equipment? Yeah, just the canoe rowing insert with these long oars so I was sculling and I had like since I had a canoe I was able to carry a bit more stuff than you would have in a backpack and I had like a five gallon water jug um took like a tent and a hammock had like a little chair um I did I put like tarps on the like the bow and the stern the and was able to just like kind of lay back if I wanted to take a break, just kind of lay on the tarp. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was able to stand up every, because the oars would give me nice stability because they're so long, just laying on the water. And so I would stand up and dance or something. Definitely like, yeah, Bluetooth speaker was very important. Like I took like a little solar panel to charge the Bluetooth speaker. And that's like the days when I had a really hard time was when it was cloudy and I didn't have battery enough to charge the Bluetooth speaker so I could not listen to podcast or music. And I was just sitting in my head all day boiling under the sun. That was the hardest. Are you bringing a cooler? No. What do you eat? Just like what I do on trails. I'm, I feel like I'm pretty basic. Even in, even in my, my minivan, I just cold soak. <laughs> After the Hayduke, I'm just like, I just cold soak. It's so much easier than even having a jet boil. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me three redeeming things about cold soaking? Because I tried it. I got explosive diarrhea. And I think it is more headache than it's worth. Really? Try to convince me it otherwise. It is so easy now. Like, so, so easy. I mean, before the Hayduke, like, I had time to research. And so I wanted to save the weight of... Cause I'm still using the same jet boil that I had in 2011. Hmm. Like a lot of my gear is still from 2011. And I'm like on the Arizona trail last year, I got rid of the jet boil to save weight. Cause I'm ca- having to carry more water. And so that was the whole thing. I was like, let me experiment with recipes beforehand. And I came up with like three different dinners and then ramen, but just the ease of it. I mean, you just put it in there and add water and you don't have to do anything. Put what in there? Like, what kind of things are you making? Because for me, it was between something that would have tasted better hot and something that I could have eaten plain. Like, I, because I started the same way where I was thinking, I'm going to save weight. I'm 5'1, cutting ounces matters. And I, like, I would love for it to work for me. I just cannot figure it out. I mean, I feel like I almost prefer cold ramen now to hot ramen. Even on a cold night? I love how fast you jumped in there. Yeah, I mean, because <laughs> so I, accusatory. Be, because I want to, I want to like it. Yes, I, I like the idea of the simplicity of it, but yeah, a, a cold, I mean, wet mush. On I a cold also night. don't drink coffee, so even when I was using my jet boil, I was only using it like every other day because I was doing like fiesta side burritos, and that would make enough for two nights. And so the second night, I would just eat it cold. And I'm like, why am I carrying this jet boil if I'm only using it every other night? I guess, okay. But for ramen, I mean, I wasn't really ever like, I guess that cold to need something hot Mm -hmm. for, for these hikes, you know? Can you walk me through a five day resupply and what you're make what you're cold soaking each of these days? Mm -hmm. Cause I think I just really need it spelled out for me. Well, and so for the Hey Duke, I buried caches along the way. So I would have this one meal I made was couscous with dehydrated lentils, coconut milk powder, and curry powder. And that was really good. That That was good. That was one of my favorites. Because couscous does like the well, the most with cold soaking. Like ramen and couscous, I think, is the best. Yeah, Um, the risotto is what, I couldn't permeate the shell, is what Google told me. (laughs) (laughs) And and that's why I I experimented before I got on trail, because... I tried grits and grits did not work for me. And 
like mashed potatoes. No, that's disgusting cold, you know, and the Fiesta sides did not work cold soaked as well. So couscous does really well. Okay. Um, I did it the minute rice with dehydrated refried beans, nutritional yeast and taco seasoning. That sounds good. That like the was, Uncle Ben's? That was good. The orange packets of minute rice? Um, yeah, something like that. And either eat that with, like, chips or tortilla. Breakfast was easy, you know, because it's oatmeal. Um, instant oatmeal with peanut butter powder, instant carnation, breakfast, chocolate powder, and um, dry milk. Are you soaking That's- that overnight? Not necessarily. Hmm. Just wake up in the morning and and that usually doesn't have to take that long. Yeah. I mean, usually I would only soak things for like 30 minutes to an hour or so. Hmm. Um, but for ramen, it was like I vowed to never eat ramen again after my AT hike because I ended up in the hospital. From I've, ramen? I've, ramen overdose? That's, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> I've, we've never had a ramen OD on the no. podcast. What happened? Just too much MSG or? No, it wasn't because of ramen. Okay. It was, I had profound anemia. So I didn't have, I mean, I lost 20 pounds on the AT and wound up, yeah, in the hospital, had to have three pints of blood transfused, two shots of iron because I didn't have enough iron to produce blood. So I had like a heart murmur it was the whole thing. Whoa. And that's because of ramen. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> uh, no. Well, just because you're just not able to eat yeah. enough. And yeah, I mean, I was, I was eating a packet of ramen or instant potatoes. I was, I just wasn't eating enough. Yeah. Is this what is contributing to all these fun additions to the cold soaking? Because I feel like you've got some crafty powders going into crafty your, powders <laughs> into your cold soaks. That's a fun trail name too. <laughs> crafty powder. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was just experimenting. Like I googled like cold soaking recipes and then just tried different ones, and um, some worked and some didn't. And I was like, oh, this is bland. You know, this isn't like. Let me add this. Like I think I did a couscous with. Um, like ranch zesty Alfredo seasoning. That sounds terrible. You, know? <laughs> you don't like Alfredo? <laughs> it just something about a zesty ranch couscous. <laughs> I don't know. It's was like it Al- good? Alfredo is like a cheesy okay. couscous. So this was good. Yeah, it was, okay. it was good. Cool. All right. Maybe one day we'll revisit cold soaking. Yeah. I should have brought some <laughs> and you could have tried. <laughs> I, that would have been a segment for sure. <laughs> Um, okay. I want to talk about the Netherlands Belgium bike packing mm. trip in 2019. Yeah, so that's my favorite okay. adventure that I've I've done. It's up there. It's what's up your, there. What's your route? Well, so this was just like all like spur of the moment. So I was over in Europe. I just did the Camino Portuguese with my mom and wanted to stay in Europe for the three months, you know, visa that you get. And I'd been doing this like trusted house sitter pet sitting gigs in different places um so i could so i didn't have to just stay in hostels all the time and i was like oh i would i'd love to do a bike trip and i was like well where should you know where should i start and i'm like well amsterdam (laughs) like that's like mecca of of bikes and so i go up there and i'm trying to buy a bike off of the internet, you know, and reading about so many stolen bikes up there. And anyway, I ended up getting a bike off of somebody, I think on Facebook, a used bike instead of having to buy like a new one. And it's just what they call like city bikes up there. So not like a mountain bike or a road bike or anything. And I think, yeah, the plan was just to go to, Cause I had, I booked, this was in 2019. So I had just booked a, a ticket to the world cup, the women's world cup, um, in France. And there was a game like right on the border of France and, and Belgium. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to bike there. And I was just going to do like 30 miles a day. I was like, this is a used bike. I didn't want to push anything. And so every day was just like very much unplanned. And so that's why I was like, that's probably my favorite trip because it wasn't planned out and it was just all very winging it. Like every night I would just book an Airbnb for the next day. I would look at 30 miles and I'm like, okay, this is the route, you know, let's see if there's an Airbnb in the area. 
and find an Airbnb, book it for the next day. Are they pretty affordable? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't doing anything probably more than like 50 euros. Mm. And some of them were great, like, and I would have a TV so I could watch the World Cup or I would watch it with the owners or, or something. Yeah. And, um, and and it's so easy riding up there because everything's so flat. And I went by windmills and it was just great. And Is went, the cross-country on bike travel a common thing out there? Like, are you encountering other bike packers? Um. I mean, I wouldn't even call myself a bike packer. Like I wasn't planning to even do that. And so I just had like my, my backpacking backpack, you know, and I just took pieces out and attached it to the front and the back and just mm. like where wore my pack yeah. as I'm going down. And I mean, just the infrastructure there in the Netherlands is so bike friendly because so many people bike there. And so that's why it felt safe. Like there was designated paths a lot, a lot just for bikes. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, like there was no specific trail that I did. I just used maps me to like make a route to the next area I was going to go in and went through Brussels and stopped there for a day, um, stayed in a hostel and, and then, so I think it ended up being about like 180 miles, but that was probably one of my favorite trips because hmm. it was all spontaneous and, and it just worked out so well. Yeah. Like no hiccups. Like, cause I was going in like not knowing if my bike was going to break down, you yeah. know, in like 20 miles. And I'm like, well, if it does, then, you know, I can always get on a bus, you know, it's Europe. Like you can, that's easy. How much of the time are you spied, spending on the bike versus exploring small villages or big cities? Yeah. I mean, I'm probably mostly on, on the bike, um, stopping to take breaks along the river or a canal or, um, go into a grocery store to get food for the night. Hmm. Just very simple. Yeah. Living and, and not even like cities, you know, in, or very small towns that I was staying at, um, where the Airbnbs were little homes. If you had a piece of advice, somebody listening to this that wanted to go and do a similar style, just riding adventure through Europe, is there anything that sticks out? I mean, I think I did probably Google like Amsterdam to Paris. And I think I probably read someone's blog. I mean, I didn't go that far, but just the infrastructure up there. And then with public transportation, like it's, it's so easy to just kind of figure it out. And like I said, I wasn't on any specific route. Like I was on just roads and sidewalks or just going through random towns. Like, and even I actually left my bike in Luxembourg at the train station <laughs> just because I was like, I was going to, to Munich to visit a friend that I met on the Camino. And I was like, I didn't want to have to, I don't think I could put it on the bus or whatever I was going on. And I didn't want to have to pay to like transport it. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this bike. <laughs> and so I just left it unlocked yeah. at the train station. You so should go back and see if someone, it's still there. Oh no, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure someone, someone took that. Yeah, someone for got sure. a nice gift for sure. <clears throat> That's fun. Uh, and, and we've talked about this on the podcast, but it has been a minute and worth revisiting. And I know you did a very nice piece on the trek about your Benton Mackay hike. Um, you did it as a section hike. Yeah, that was over se several sections that yeah. I did that. that. And that was during COVID? Um, 2020, 2021, yeah. Yeah. I guess. Is it coincidental that that was during COVID or just? Well, I mean, so I did the Penhody in 2020 because that's in Alabama. And so I felt like that was safe to do since it wasn't that far from where I was yeah. at my parents. Um, and I had just worked for the census, <laughs> which was horrible. <laughs> Why that is was, that? Oh my God. That was like the worst. <laughs> We're going to have to revisit bottom three jobs. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I let that skirt pass, but census. Yeah, definitely. One Counting of the worst. people yeah. door to door. Yeah. Not fun Oof. at all. Um, I've, is it true that, um, refusing to fill out the census is less of a penalty than just like half-assing it and inputting incorrect information. I mean, I feel like they got 10 years to deal with this stuff yeah. in between. It's like, get your shit together, get your shit together yeah. <laughs> because it was just like a clusterfuck. Yeah. Like it was just, I feel like not very well managed and 
definitely like didn't feel safe a lot of times too because they're like taking just like it was all on my phone or the phone that they gave you and you were like going back to the same place and it was like you can mark that it was like not that they're hostile but it was like you can indicate like they don't want to talk to you you know and it's like they keep wanting to send you back. And I'm like, I'm not going back. Yeah. He's got an eight out of 10 on aggressiveness. I'm not going, there. you know? And then it's like, sometimes you'd go to this one house and if, if nobody was there, then you were supposed to go to like their, the neighbors. You're supposed to like go to three different neighbors to ask them. And it's like, who neighbors are going to like, want to give you that information too. You know, it's just, I feel like you have I to feel be an like extrovert to do this the, job. The setup was not great. And by the end, I was just like, just picking which ones I wanted to go to. I was just like, I'm just going to go to this one. I'm not going to go to that one. I'm gonna go to this one. But anyway, so then I hiked the Pinhoti. And and that's when I learned that the the terminus for the Pinhoti is just when it hits the Benton Mackay. And then if I just turned on the Benton Mackay, then I would go to Springer Mountain. So then I just wanted to connect all that mm. because Flag Mountain on the Pinhoti southern terminus is like the official like beginning of the appalachians and so i was like oh i just want to do the whole range so I, let me just connect and so that's when i did that f- the first section of the benton mckay was from the Pinhoti to springer and then like the next spring i did more of the benton mckay and then finished the smokies up like in that fall how does the benton mckay compare to the Pinhoti? um well i would say there's more of the comparison of the Benton Mackay to the beginning of the AT sure. because that's like was the original route or mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and I like to say, like, I think I probably wrote in the article <laughs> was that I did not like the Smokies on the AT. But the Smokies on the Benton Mackay, I loved. I was like, it was a totally different Smokies experience for me. Hmm. And maybe it was because it was also a different time of the year, like being in the Smokies in April and it's cold and snowy. Um, whereas I was there in May, but you're, you're along the lake. Um, so you're not on the ridge line like the AT is. And so there's so much water and the weather's not quite as inclement, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I really enjoyed the bit and Mackay section through the AT. Hmm. I mean, through the Smokies and I highly recommend people doing that section yeah like that would be great and it's it's longer than the at i think just by a little bit through the smokies i'll take a page out of chance's book here and give someone the elevator pitch on why they should do the benton mckay trail just in general or (laughs) not that you're a representative i've got time to kill i've got options this is one of my options well, I, I liked it as an alternative to the beginning of the AT. Huh. Um, if you want something that's less crowded, because you're going to you're going to hit back on the AT um, at Fontana Dam at, at that shelter and then you diverge again. Um, so if you want something that's less crowded than the AT, something that's the original route, you know, like. Mm purist in that sense maybe um i love that it's purist but also like anti-purist because the purists want that continuous footpath right. where you don't do alternates yeah i but think then it's purist because it's the original that's kind of fun yeah i think a lot of people probably just like the idea of it just not being as crowded yeah because yeah the, like the first four miles you're you're crossing the at at the beginning and then you're fairly parallel and then you cross back at Fontana Dam, and then at the end of the Smokies, you can just go back and hit the AT from there. So it was the elevator pitch, less crowded AT, basically? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Purist. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, and then we'll wrap here with the freshest, freshest event in your resume, which you recently completed the Hey Duke. Well, I wouldn't say completed. Okay. <laughs> um. I mean, so the Hey Duke is, is, you know, a route than a trail. And so it's like, choose your own adventure. And so for this year, I don't think anybody was able to complete it because the snow 
So the section that I had to skip was in the Grand Canyon. So they didn't, the North Kaibab Trail and the North Rim wasn't even open until June 2nd this year, which was like weeks and weeks later than normal. And due to the snow levels at the North Rim and the people ahead of me got to a creek that was just impassable. And so some people turned around there or like had to find different ways. And so um, had to skip that section. But we had another writer who I think confronted the same thing. Oh. And maybe this was someone that was in the group ahead of you. Oh, yeah. Kate maybe. Richard. I don't know if you're familiar. Okay. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't know their tall name, but. Um, I do know it and it's escaping me. It'll come to me. So tell us about the experience. Yeah. Uh, incredible. I, ever since like the Arizona Trail last year, um, and having lived in Flagstaff, like I think the Colorado Plateau is one of the most spectacular regions in the lower 48. And, you know, I'd been to all the parks in Utah and just wanted to see more. And I've been wanting to do it for a long time and didn't think that I was skilled enough to do it because I hadn't done the CDT or, you know, and, but I met last year on the Arizona trail, I met a solo Hayduker and talked to her and started thinking, okay, maybe this is doable and spent the time planning and researching, which I haven't had to do for a long hike, probably since the AT, <laughs> you know, like I just haven't had to really plan like that. Um, but I felt like it was needed for this because it is next level I think when it comes to backpacking and just with the cross-country navigation being one of the main things and then I think being on the Arizona Trail helped me deal with like desert environments and knowing about water and carrying so much water and how much water I drink and and for that factor um but yeah just started in arches and was incredible um like definitely had some issues <laughs> like probably more so than i've had on any other trail but you just kind of figure it out as you go like i lost my tent poles <laughs> in canyon lands ended up getting them back <laughs> what's the story there? um like i met some people that i hiked with for a little bit in canyon lands and i was with them when i lost my tent poles and they thought it was probably close to the road and they were shuttling back and forth and I was like, I'm just going to get another tent mailed to me and just use that. And the day that, or the day before my tent got express mailed <laughs> from Alabama, um, they had found the tent poles when they went back to, to do their shuttle car and they had left it on their car at the other location when I passed by and they were like, Hey, look what I found. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no way. Um, yeah, I lost my tent poles and then had some post holing and snow, which I had never really had to do that before. And that was kind of a, my fault thing because I didn't realize the elevation I was going to be at and didn't talk to the Rangers about the conditions. And so that was a struggle and then ended up being in these canyons where the, the creeks were rising from the snow melt. And so I was fording like hip deep in some water, which was, I didn't feel like was super dangerous. I, f it was a little risky, but not anything I didn't feel s safe doing. It was the time when I like climbed up and over to, to bypass fording, that was one of my sketchiest parts when I was on like the cliff edge. That was a sketchy spot. <laughs> what happened there? Um, yeah, I just like, so yeah, you're in a canyon and so it's bending and meandering. And so sometimes I would just go up and over instead of trying to ford. And one of these times I went up and over, you're just like, yeah, you're, you're not on any trail. You're just trying to figure it out. And I'm like, okay, I need to get down to this level and you're going back and forth trying to find a way to get down um and i went down this one spot and i was like this looks like it's the only way to go <laughs> that i can get down to this lower level and but it was just very small footing right on the edge 
and I, you know, had to take my pack off and then I dropped down and then I'm reaching up to get my pack and I'm realizing like if this pack shifts at all, like the, the weight, um, it could push me over. Hmm. And I had already like, when I moved, like my water bottles had fallen, you know, flew out of the side pockets and went into the creek down below and so I was like okay this is really sketchy and so I was going super slow trying to move this pack because I was like if it starts moving at all I'm I gotta be hands off Mm because it's gonna take me down and that was the sketchiest part and I really shouldn't have put myself in that situation Mm -hmm. and that was also another learning point of the hey duke is I tried to you know there's alternates and bypasses and there was one alternate I tried to do to cut some miles and go down this drop down into this canyon and I just couldn't find a way and I had to turn around because I was like, this is too risky to try to make this work, even though you've, which is hard, I think, for a through hiker mentality. You've, you've spent the time to go this way and it's to turn around, you know, feels like a failure, you know, but it's the safest choice. And I had to shift that thinking on this trail for sure, because it was like, this is too risky. I have to just turn around. Yeah. I did that on a hike last year and I was just cussing myself out the entire time. I felt like a real asshole. Yeah, yeah you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fact. Okay. So you had mentioned looking into the Hey Duke, doing research beforehand, it feeling like it might be above your skill level and then taking steps to make sure you were comfortable and ready for it when you took it on. Now that you've gotten through this trip, what things do you think you did in prep that were really, really valuable towards making the trail successful for you and what things would you have wanted to go back and put more time into? And then I'll just, as I'm piggybacking on this, what could you have done with less of just in prep terms? Yeah. I mean, really all I did was read blogs um, and the guidebook and Skirka's handbook and, and things like that. And, in retrospect, it didn't really help me that much because a lot of that was is outdated now. Um, the Facebook group page was really one of the most helpful um, resources for that. Um, and, and really just the people that was ahead of me that was reporting back. So I don't know if there's anything that I could have done more of. I, I really am a proponent of just like putting yourself out there and like learning. like. And having done it now, it's like it wasn't as difficult as I think a lot of people think it is um, because I don't I didn't really have navigational skills of like comp- map and compass before. Like I carried that, um, but I didn't have to use it. Can you see the tread of the trail? Because I think that, too, like, hey, do could be a cool one to do my snakes. But. I'm also like when I think of the Hey Duke, I think about like a vast open trailless desert and burying stuff. And that's kind of the only as much as we've talked about it, the only concept my brain seems to stick to. Yeah. I mean, since you're going through the the parks, like when you're in the national parks, like you're usually on like a trail. There's certain parts where it is cross country navigation. Um But I had, you know, tracks on my GPS that I could follow. And then other times you're just in canyons. And I mean, when you're in a canyon, like there's, you're following the canyon. So there's really, I mean, it would be difficult in some of the canyons where they were just full of boulders. And so navigating through that was difficult. I kind of compared it to the Mahusik Notch, Mm -hmm. like the slow going of that, like having to scramble over the boulders was slow going but really when you're in canyons like there's only one way you're going so even though you're not on a trail like you're just following a drainage you're following a wash and so that's usually what it is and so the only times i had other cross-country navigation it it wasn't really difficult it was just going through sage brush which was just frustrating but are you concerned about flash flooding in the canyons? Because I know in places like Zion, that's a concern. Yeah, for sure. Um, and one of the alternates would go through Buckskin Gulch, which is the famous Lot Canyon. Um, and so you definitely have to be concerned. How do you keep an eye flood. on that? I mean, you just have to check 
weather forecast, which that's another story because I've done Buckskin Gulch before and I did get ca- caught in a flash flood in Priya Canyon, which is right. That was my first flash flood. Experience. That's and, terrifying. And so having had that, like that did help me go into this knowing like, because when I did that, like it, it did rain a little bit that night before but it didn't rain hard enough for a flash flood. And so in the morning when it came down, it was like, you know, where is this coming from? And it's like, well, it's coming from the headwaters, like in Bryce Canyon, where it obviously rained a lot there and just took this long to, to get to me hmm. there. So you but said it's your first, it was your first flash flood experience. Does that signify that there were more than no, one? No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. That was the only time. I guess because the Hayduke's so remote. So you're checking you have to bring a device that you're going to be able to check your weather on for something like that. Like you have to have something. I mean, I, I didn't No, I mean, like I, I went in and I did the food caches cause I wasn't expecting to go into towns much, um, because it is so remote and the hitches were long. Um, but I ended up going into maybe more towns than I expected to go into. And when I would be in town, like I would, check the reports of things and that's because the snow levels were so high going through the henry mountains like usually the route goes over mount ellen and nobody was going over mount ellen because the snow was so much and so i learned people were going this other way so i went a different way to get around that and so it was very much like you get to town and you kind of plan for the next section you know feels like the sierra as you go do you have cell service? I know those are really remote spots in Utah. I don't imagine there's a ton. Yeah. I I went two weeks in between Hanksville and Tropic because um, I didn't go into the town of Escalante. And that was two weeks in between towns. And so that was my longest stretch. But I was surprised that, like, I would get to a high point and I would have service hmm. a couple times. Yeah. Um, so. So you, you mentioned that it was easier than you were expecting. Is that purely just the fact that GPS eliminates all the navigational challenges? Yeah, I would, I would think so. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I also met um, a man I had met last year on the Arizona trail in, in dark Canyon. And that's the sketchy spot where we were fording the Creek and the people behind me actually had to get helicopter rescued out because the water was so high and like he he was having a hard time going through the canyon and it's just what every people don't like certain things you know and and that just wasn't his thing Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so he was struggling with that and for that reason he probably didn't like that section of the trail you know whereas for me like it was difficult um but it wasn't like i i still enjoyed doing that and I like the slot canyons and there was another spot where people were kind of bypassing because there was a, like a 12 foot drop down into a slot and you had like lower your pack down and I'm looking at it and I'm like, how am I going to get down there? <laughs> you know? And, and for scrambling around the boulders, it's just, you, you kind of, I'm not a climber or anything. So I'm just looking at which route I can take and you just kind of, find a line and, and go and I was able to drop down into it and and then later I learned that people would bypass it and I was like oh okay for me like I saw a big help for me was even though I'm not on a trail like I would follow footprints a lot I felt like I got really good at tracking because <laughs> I would be like oh there's some altered there's some Solomon prints and you would just follow that and yeah, it'd be like a little foot <laughs> and it was it was validating because it was like oh my gosh thank goodness that these people were ahead of me like maybe a few days or so and I could follow them and or I would get to a spot where it was, you would have to drop down and I'm like, oh, I don't see any footprints there. So they must've found a different way down. And then you find a spot, oh, there's prints here. This is where they went down at, mm. you know? And, and that would help me know, like, this has been done. Like somebody's do- done this, like I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> when you mentioned sending your pack down first, are you making modifications to your gear, like bringing a piece of rope or a piece of paracord, or are you just giving it a good kick and? Yeah, know? the hey do, it, Definitely they recommend taking rope and I had to do pack hauls a a few times, either climbing up and then pulling it up or dropping it down and then scrambling down just because my pack was heavier than it usually is for this one because I was carrying a solar panel. I was carrying a lot more water. Um, 
and some of the scrambles are sketchy and having that much weight, like pulling you back. Like I didn't feel like I was agile enough. And so I had to take my pack off a lot and just lower it down. And, and sometimes, yeah, you could, you could kick it. Sure. But I mean, like if you didn't want to like break shit, you know, you would just lower it down with a rope. Usually it works best when you're not mad. <laughs> it's a rope. You'd mentioned before we hit the record button that going into this hike, you were dealing with imposter syndrome because yeah. all of your other hikes were very like on trail yeah. and it, very easy to follow the, the trodden path. At what point did you feel the imposter syndrome dissipate? Was it pretty early on in the hike? Was it after you'd gotten off? Where in that journey did that occur? Yeah, I don't know if there's a specific moment. I definitely was very anxious, you know, at the beginning. It was like, I'm excited because I love this landscape. I love this region. Um, and I just wanted to see stuff, you know, like that's was the main goal was I just wanted to see this area. And I just every day felt like a victory. And that was different too. It was like getting through like just one section of one day. It was like, oh, I did that. I made it, you know, and then it compiled and compiled. And then it was like, oh, I, I'm in Tropic. And I'm like, oh, man, I just did all that. Like I did that, <laughs> you know, and then by the end it was like, kind of in disbelief that it had happened because just along the way, every day was a victory mm. to get through that, um, which was pretty special. Mm. Just very different than the other hikes that I've done. Yeah. Um, How has that affected, if you, if you can take a step back from yourself and look at like this grand resume that all three of us are kind of in awe by, and you can s try to see this as not maybe the most recent one, but maybe a couple of years from now when this is somewhere sandwiched in between, how is doing something like the Hey Duke going to impact what comes next? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, definitely has given me the confidence. Um, I mean, I do most of these things by myself and I enjoy like meeting people and, and I usually do meet people to hike with, um, the Hey Duke, I only met like 11 people hmm. and only like six of them on trail. The other times it was in towns. So definitely not many people out there. Um, there was like a bubble <laughs> ahead of me. I think there was like four, pe four or five <laughs> people. That was the bubble. That's the bubble. <laughs> that was the bubble. Um, but no, it's, it's definitely given me confidence. But I always feel like for anything, like you just have to be prepared. Like, you know, I don't want to think that I could can do anything now like there's still definitely things that I'm not as comfortable with um that I would just need to practice <laughs> more um, but hopefully I can get back and do that section um this fall and before we wrap the hey duke I know you're writing a book is that correct yeah yeah um yeah on the on the trail because I was planning on going to Alaska after the Hey Duke. And then when I was on the trail, I was just couldn't go to sleep one night. And I just kept getting these thoughts and it just kind of hit me. I'm like, Oh, maybe I should just write a book about this. And I don't think anybody else has really written about the Hey Duke. And, and for the rest of my time, I, I felt kind of validated in that decision to like stay in Utah, stay in Moab. Um, to try to write this instead of go up to Alaska to stay in the area and, and be inspired still by the landscape to write this. And the other goal was to get on the river trip, <laughs> the Colorado river trip. And, and it was like that dream came true, which was, that's a amazing story in, it, in itself. And, and hopefully will be part of the book as well. But yeah, just going to write about the, the hike and we'll see. <laughs> I've been, Do you have a timeline? Um, I mean, I know y'all are authors. Like, I've been writing another book of like short stories, memoir of all the other adventures because I, I didn't feel like my AT hike was like special enough just to write a book about that, right? Or like just about the Mississippi River. But I feel like when I compile it all together, like, and focusing on like just one aspect of those trips. I, I like that short story mm. aspect, um, I think is interesting. Yeah. And so that was like the other book I had been working on. Um, but then I, yeah, shifted focus to try to, to maybe do this one, but I don't have a time. Okay. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm really busy now. That's why I wanted to stay in the area to try to get as much done as I could. Um, in like the month or so that I've 
was hanging out in Moab, but yeah. I was going to say, if I can rec- recommend anything, it's uh, go down to Durango and hang out at that Starbucks. <laughs> That's where I wrote the entire really? hiking from wow. home book. Is I, there was a nice shoulder on the road by the Durango trailhead of the Colorado Trail where I'd park the car every night. And the people at that Starbucks are so nice. They just started giving me free Starbucks every day because <laughs> I think they thought there was something wrong with me. <laughs> well, we've gone through almost a, a more than an hour and a half and we've yada 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 a lot of your journey so obviously there's more to tell here thank you for coming on backpacker radio and sharing it uh let people know where they can follow you i know you have an active youtube channel you do the social media let yeah know sarah, more. sarah tidewalker on youtube and instagram where in the world is sarah.com sweet <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us thank you i'm so happy to be here <laughs> to the trek propaganda portion of today's show um, I shouldn't have said it as happy as I did because I don't like the story one bit. This is a uh, missing Appalachian Trail hiker found dead in Vermont. Yeah, that was sad. Um, this one is by our new managing editor, Owen Eggenbrot. Vermont State Police have located the body of a man that they believe to be missing, ap- the missing Appalachian Trail hiker, Robert Carricker, a.k.a. Steady Eddie. According to a press release, the deceased was found one and a half miles downstream from where the AT crosses Stony Brook. Heavy rains and flooding affected the region on July 10th, the day after Kirker was last seen. Investigators do not believe there is anything suspicious about his death and agree that the evidence points to an accident caused by unusually high water. That sucks. Yeah. Our, our wishes, obviously, well wishes go out to friends and family of the deceased. Um, okay. Let's, let's make this a little bit more lively because that's not fun. Question of the day, what is a petty hill you will die on? Yeah, I'm pulling up my notes right now. Did you think of this one or did I think of this one? It seems like me, but... The, that was the first time I've read this, so I don't recall. If you put it in the text, I don't remember it. Okay. But that happens a lot. Well, I started keeping a note on my phone of things that I bring up in random that I want to then remember my thoughts on because I've realized that if I don't write it down, um, it doesn't exist in my brain. Yeah. Petty hills I should die on. Because I've got an answer. I just want to make sure I don't skip past the answer that I had gotten triggered with and I don't think I will so okay I didn't write it down I don't know what petty hill that was but I have one that I would die on plenty of hills they need to include roundabouts in driving tests mm. why do people not understand how to use a roundabout yeah the, non- the amount of people that treat entering the roundabout as and maybe I'm gonna look like a fool here by acting like I'm a roundabout expert when I could say something wrong but the way I understand it when you approach the roundabout, you yield. And if no one's coming, you enter, right? Seems simple. The amount of people treating it like a stop sign that just stop and there's a car on the other side that hasn't even made it past the next exit of the roundabout that just wait for the car to completely exit the roundabout. It's, it's here's the thing. The apartment I used to live at, they installed two roundabouts near it. And ever since they did, my road rage has increased yeah because i don't understand what is so hard to conceptual conceptualize about entering and exiting a roundabout it's supposed to make things more productive yeah why can't we do it did you have a lot of roundabouts growing up no put them in a road test yeah well that's what i'm saying i you couldn't even road test that in woodstock illinois because i don't know where you drive to to do it make a course Put it, you put it where the DMV is. DMV roundabout. Yeah. But like, I'm why would we the not? The first time I even encountered a roundabout. I've got to learn to K turn, but I don't need to learn how to use a roundabout. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a fun fact here to lighten it up. Yeah. Um, there is a town in England called Skelmersdale, and they have the whole town. My friend Charlotte lives there. I've been there. Whole town does not have a single traffic light because they wanted to test how efficient roads would be if they only used roundabouts. And apparently you could tell if you're from Skem in the rest of England because if you take your car and look at it, like the tires are all worn out on one side and not the other from mm. going around the roundabout so much. Yeah. Um, but just, I don't know, maybe it's because not a lot of us grow up with them. But once they installed those two by me, I realized how little we know about using a roundabout. Mm-hmm where it just it skyrockets all the rage in my heart. There's a major roundabout in Golden. You probably There's two I take to get here. Yeah, but like the big one is the one that connects South Golden Road with Johnson Road and I think those are Yeah. the two main roads. There's the one by uh, Bumps and 
something. It's a maternity shop, and then it leads into the other one by the high school. Yeah. They have the sign for which roads you can turn on based on which lane you enter in at the roundabout. It's highly efficient. Yeah, no, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm saying that I think adding that sign r- removes the confusion for people. Because I think, generally speaking, people are pretty efficient at that roundabout. Well, The I ones didn't... past that on South Golden Road is a little bit more uh, wild, wild west. If you own a home, home inspection company and the name of it is the opposite of the word lose, you came to a full stop in the roundabout today and treated it as the middle of the roundabout was a stop. So That's not a good look. No, and this is just today. Yeah, This is something that I have had this on my triple crown of hot takes yeah. that we've been saving. I'm gonna have to think of a new hot take. Okay. But this is a hot take that I've been sitting on since we came up with triple crown of hot takes in Christmas season. Sure. And okay. every time I go through a roundabout, I get even more upset. I'm kind of torn between two, also traffic related. So apparently that's where mo- most of people's frustrations stem from. I think the one I'm going to pick is the people who don't pull forward, who are in the left turn lane. I hate them. Yeah. It's usually, I'm not going to, it's usually old people. (laughs) It's someone that's like way too cautious on the road. That's the thing that makes me the most mad because I'm very aggressive. If I'm like the second person in line, I'm also pulling into the middle of the intersection and I'm getting that last little bit. I will advocate for old people and women, the two most disparaged against on the roads. Yeah. I have had arguments with not one, but several significant others at different portions and not at the same time, but significant others who have thought that that's wrong. And I'm like, to who? It's wrong Wrong if if there's a red arrow. You have to pull to the center because if you are in the left lane and you do not pull to the center and there is heavy traffic coming from the opposite direction, the light's going to turn red again and you're going to have not moved forward and there will have been no progress in your entire line and eventually that line's going to get longer and it's going to cause a bottleneck. You have to pull to the middle because even if the traffic's super heavy, then at least one car goes because it's already in the middle. Like it's just- co- You don't even it, have to explain it. It's just the right way it to is. drive. It's there's just n- the correct way and if you're not doing that, provided there's not a red arrow, that's the only exception obviously. But yeah, if you don't pull into this, the intersection as the left turn person, you're, you're being a butthead, a real butthead, a bona fide butthead. I've read that there are like there's certain personality traits. Like this is me just looking into ADHD as a potential thing that I probably definitely have. Um, but there are certain things where like depending on your personality and like your self, there are people that get extremely upset over like right versus wrong and doing like things the right way versus the wrong way more so than others. And I think I have that because when people don't do, especially with driving road things correct, it really upsets me. Ultimately the real critique just comes back to me because I get frustrated in traffic always because I'm running behind because I'm terrible at time management. So my frustration is really just me handling my time poorly but still you're doing it wrong you're being a a jerk a real jerk it's one of the things that you've done most of in like if you've gotten your license at 16 or 18 or 25 whenever it is like this is something you've done for as long as like most things you do every day like walking yeah you know like just do it right actually i changed my answer what is it that's a good one one that just flashing back to my college days where Wisconsin folk get this absolutely wrong. Traveling on the interstate, people in Wisconsin just cruise in the left hand lane. That's fucked. That's the worst. But that's obvious. That's obvious. The not worst. to them, it's not. Like, it's a cultural thing that they just see two lanes and they don't have any distinguishing qualities and anyone can just do whatever the heck they want. Why am I not swearing? The real, the dad in me is coming out today. Um, I mean, I have a video of you driving in Wisconsin and driving it is in quotes because you had autopilot on, on yeah. the car and you were eating a cheeseburger and yeah. french fries at the wheel. Which was the correct way to go about it. I don't and think you were in the right lane. Uh, uh, who cares? I made that part up. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, if your memory <laughs> of what lane I was in as I was eating a cheeseburger and autopilot. I was afraid. Can't be that good. But um, yeah, this is a very stereotypical. I think this is the further you get from big cities, people just tend to not be as type A about driving habits. And uh, just the close. I'm from chicago land area ish so you have to be aggressive you have to drive a certain <laughs> way and when you get away from that people just drive incorrectly well i think it's people that come from because if you don't live near a big city and you're in a rural area do you right yeah. like there's not a lot of cars in the road drive however you want you know 
But then it's when those people move to big cities like Denver, where people keep moving yeah. to, where they bring those habits to an anxious New Yorker like me who has trouble, you know, controlling my rage. Um, they clog the pipes. It, it, it causes a lot of stress. Yeah, agreed. Petty Hills to die on. There we go. That was a good one. Um, okay, Triple Crown of the Worst Appetizers. <clears throat> You're going to skip my mini one? Uh, I wrote it small, but our new segment? The one star of trail reviews? Yeah. Oh. Don't skip I thought that. You don't want to I'm on a time it? crunch. Can we do this in the next episode? Oh, yeah. Zach's got kids. Okay. Yeah. Triple crown. <laughs> Triple crown of worst appetizers. Go. Yeah. You want me to go first? Yeah. Onion rings. Fuck them. Ooh, strong disagree. I know. It's a hot, We've spicy about topic. Before. Yeah. I don't like that the outside's crunchy and the inside's a slimy slug. Mm. If if you can't get a clean, solid bite through it and it pulls out the rest of the onion and you're sitting there, hands greasy and breading, trying to keep the wormy onion inside of it, it's it's a no for me. Yeah. I'm going to go and say that a, a good onion ring is probably top three fried food, period. Yeah, but how many onion rings are a good onion ring? Uh, you know what? I tried, I haven't had it, but I tried to go to the King of Wings recently. I was on Leo duty and I was going to take him out to dinner, but there was like a 30 minute line to get in. And I noticed the uh, table, people were snacking on the onion rings and they looked fantastic. I, I'm open to changing my opinion when I have a good onion ring. I'm just not. If you've gone this far in life and you don't like onion rings, I'm just guessing you're not an onion ring person. I'm just not willing to go to the effort of filling space in my stomach with something that's so potentially wrong. Sure. Um, my first one, I'm not, I'm not the biggest potato guy in general. And I think this one kind of bums me out the most is the loaded potato skins. Mm, I'm out on agreeing with you when it comes to the cheese and the bacon bits on it. That part's fire. I'm back in with you where sour cream doesn't have a taste to me and having to dip a potato in ranch to make it swallow, swallow a bowl. Yeah. It's a lot of effort. It's so. just too much potato. Like, I'm in the middle. It's it's like mashed potatoes with some stuff that makes it palatable on top. I'm not a. Mm, I'm gonna like it. Don't they like dig it out to fill they it? They dig out some of it, but they leave some of the the, the potato ness in. And it's too much for me. I'm not a fan. You'd rather a potatoless potato skin. Yeah, just give me the bacon and the cheese. I don't know. Fair. Find a way to combine those. Um, um, my next one. It's kind of a classification. Are we skipping our guest? We're not inviting oh, her. Oh, she said she just wanted to listen. Oh, okay, cool. I, I missed that. Part. I wasn't trying to be rude. Do you yeah. have anything you want to throw uh, in the mixer? <laughs> I'm gonna go with, and I actually like this when it's well done, but it's done so poorly so often that I have to stick with my guns here. Ceviche. If you go to like a, a seafood restaurant in some place that's next to the ocean, that gets good reviews that I will go on that all day long. Big fan. But if you go to Applebee's and you get ceviche, you're, you're going to have diarrhea the next day. Um, that, I have a whole list of seafood appetizers, but ceviche was the one that stuck out to me. Okay. Um, ceviche is what I would not have thought of. Um, let's see. There's so many options to think of. I'm kind of out, and maybe this is more of a side than an appetizer, but I've never been able to get into asparagus. Have you had an asparagus? Like, even if it's a bacon-wrapped asparagus, oh. like, even if they, I was going like, to say, if you're getting asparagus as an appetizer, you're going to a very well, healthy restaurant. So I think of, I think there's a, tri I think there's a triple crown of green served on their own vegetable appetizers like i'm not talking a salad or something but there's the artichoke hearts there's the brussels sprouts and there's the asparagus mm -hmm. those are the three and i've come around to artichoke hearts after having a very kind friend show me how to eat it um brussels sprouts i used to hate but depending on the restaurant they can actually do them very good asparagus it is a hard crunchy tree like i just cannot wrap my head around eating an asparagus i really enjoy asparagus so i'm not gonna help you out there but okay, well. understood it's a vegetable yeah not for everyone um and my next one this is a, we said it would be really easy it's kind of hard yeah i mean because i think there's good versions of all of these things i'm just thinking of like you just take me to the average place oh this is probably gonna be i'm gonna i'm gonna give an appetizer that's kind of like a little on the fence 
but it's also going to fall in my theme of the onions. French onion soup. Not a fan. I'm against you there, too. Um, I get it. I get it. Are we rounding up to include soups, though, in appetizers? People get their soup as an appetizer. It comes before the meal. Yeah. It's just it's its, its own section on the menu. Yeah, it's no, not... that's why I said it was on the fen- it's on the fence. Okay. It's borderline. But yeah. French onion soup's one that a lot of people like, and it kind of freaks me out. Just anything with a clean layer of cheese is going <laughs> to probably win me over. That's where it gets me. Yeah, but what hit, what is hidden below the cheese? doesn't matter. There's enough cheese. It's onion I can pl- water. Yeah, yeah. I'm gather, gathering you're not a big onion gal. I am. I, I used to not be, but I am now in food. Like, I'll make onions and peppers to go with a steak. I have a prediction that in the next two years, you're going to find onion rings that you like, and you're going to totally change your tune. Okay. I'm open to that. Yeah. My last one is, you don't see this at many places, but I it was so bad for me in high school that I haven't had it since, and it, it actually stuck with me, is a Monte Cristo. Is that what, Monte Crisco? You just got on me about soup, and you're saying an entire sandwich? You open the floodgates. Soup is served before the meal. The Monte Cristo is the meal. It, at Applebee's, the Applebee's I was at, it was served in tiny triangles as an appetizer. Sliders. No, it was the triangle bread. Like, it was the, the three-tiered bread with, like, the... Quesadilla. What are we saying right now? Triangle breads. Triangle. No, like, just normal... I'm thinking sourdough or white bread just cut into triangles, as in like not half of a sandwich, but cut into probably sixths. Did you go somewhere where they cut your sandwich into little triangles? Yeah, because it was an appetizer. No, and it has the uh, toothpick in it with the little like flary bit at the top. That's the mark of a true appetizer. Okay, this is a stretch, but I'll take it. Just I don't like the combination of savory and jam. Get that shit out of my life. Okay. I, I don't... Jam you doesn't belong in a lot of things, like donuts. I don't understand those, like the, the jam-filled munchkins. Yeah. I don't loathe it, but it's definitely not the one that I go it's for. It's the worst surprise you can get. Mm. Um, I'll throw in an honorable mention, anything with pesto. Again, very strong disagree. I'm a, I'm a big pesto person. It's a strong taste and not in a good way. Um, there's got to be others. I'm, the problem is right now I'm hungry, so everything I'm looking <laughs> at, I'm like, I could eat that. Yeah. Uh, Anything with cream cheese is going to win me over. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. It's hard to lose on a cheese. One thing I thought I would like more because I like fried food and I love pickles, but fried pickles are just a little weird for me. I like them, but in a controlled environment. Like, you can't have too many. You can't go to town if, on fried Yeah, pickles. too much vinegar will just destroy your palate. So. Ooh, if we want to diss the South here, boil, those boiled I was literally thinking of the same thing. The, the, gross. They're gross. So gross. Yeah. We talked about Don's last night. That's something that they used to do at Don's when they would play, like, the South Carolina games. Yeah. They'd have a, like, some local yokel would bring in a crock pot of these, like, boiled, slimy nuts. Which is crazy because regular peanuts are amazing. Like, why would you go through the effort to ruin a thing that's already fine? It's coming out in water that's green. Yeah. Like, it's... There's a barbecue place in Idaho Springs. Smoking Yards, maybe? I forget the name of it. Um, and the place is great. Amazing barbecue. Maybe some of the best in Colorado. But as, like, a wait-for-your-food item, they have boiled peanuts. And it's such a disappointment every time. Why do you get it every time? Because I'm a fat boy, and if you're going to put out food for free, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> okay, fair. I'm going to eat it. Okay, cool. Even, even knowing I won't like it, I'm going to eat it. Um, I'm going to say anything that's done in a pinwheel. Pinwheel? Like, why do you have to make it a pinwheel? I like it in, like, a wedding context. Like, I can have one or two of these. Nice to chase your gin and tonic with, but... Oh, we got to do upcoming Triple Crown. I'm ignoring your time crunch here. Upcoming Triple Crown, we got to do. Rachel, take note. Triple Crown of... Wedding hors d'oeuvres. The, Same conversation, I The think. shit they pass around on those little trays yeah. when you're waiting for the actual stuff. I have a blast every wedding, making sure I try everything. Yeah. And it's always so good. I think that's the only context I ever eat crab cakes in weddings. I could do a wedding where we don't even have a meal. There's no just actual apps. served meal. Yeah. It's just throughout the entire hours. Sure. They don't stop. Open bar and apps. Yeah. And the apps just keep coming. Yeah. 
We should do that for a podcast sometime. Get someone to cater it and just walk in with trays. Next Palooza? Yeah. Okay. Oh, down. Done. <clears throat> um, mailbag. Okay. Chance, what do you have against New Jersey? <laughs> I'm from New York. We have ocean breezes, pine forests, forested highlands, and beautiful farmlands, and they all smell so good. They smell much better than a moldy tent in a bear canister. LOL. Worst candle scent would be through hiker shoes. Um, what do I have against New Jersey? It's just like a New York thing. Um, what do I, I see have? a lot of East Coasters hating on Connecticut nowadays. Is that a thing? I've heard Connecticut hate, and I think it's because it's very preppy like and expensive. And so I think there's a bit of bitterness there that mm. it's not worth the cost. But I don't know for sure because I... It sounds right because one of the critiques that someone posted on Twitter saying that he was thinking about moving to Connecticut and someone commented being like, it's only a matter of time before you look like this. And it's some guy with five polos, all pop collars, <laughs> just See, like a rainbow of polos. That's my problem is that my aesthetic, I would say, is very coastal. Ah. Like a they, the term they use for it on TikTok these days is either coastal granddaughter or coastal grand millennial. And it's like the blues and the whites and the stripes and the cardigans and that sort of thing. And sure. I just love that style. Very vampire weekend. And they always have those like houses on the shore with the hydrangeas all over them. For me, I just love the aesthetic. Sure. Um, you grew up with it. There's, I'm sure there's nostalgia built in there. I mean, downstate New York doesn't really... It's not that. I think I think there's... But didn't you go to, like, vacation at those places? No. My parents yeah. took us to the farmhouse. Yeah. Um, but I watched Gilmore Girls. Oh, yeah. Well, there's that, too. So I would like to be a future Emily yeah. in the best way. Five-star review. Just wow. I love hiking, backpacking, and dream of a long through hike. This podcast feeds my wanderlust and has heaping helping of humor and poop stories. Keep it up. That's from River Lawyer. Reminder on the you poop guys should stories. Connect. Poop stories. Yeah, just at the like, end of the... Oh, you mean for the project, the yeah. amazing project of pooping in the woods? Yes. Yeah, if you guys have a great poop story, uh, head to the show notes and hit the submission link there because we want to feature it for the world. Um, call back to the episode if you have, like, even if it's not you making an embarrassment of yourself pooping, but if you are a ridge runner and you have some shit stirring story, like any poop related outdoorsy stories, yeah. send them our way. Yeah. We're not biased. We're not biased. Sticker code. Mm. Um, give us a one star review of something that you wouldn't expect to leave a review for. Example, how Zach didn't expect to find reviews of the Mississippi River. Give us a one star review in the comments on the Instagram post for this episode of something that we wouldn't expect to see get a review. Give your uncle a one star like, review. But something we would know, right? Like you can't do like the rock by the street sign near your house. We're not going to know what that is. It's not going to be funny to us. Yeah. Um, People who don't pull forward at the left hand turn. Yeah, like a one star review for roundabouts in general. A yeah. one star review for um, public bathrooms in general. A one star review. There's been a lot of funny ones for national parks. Um, a one star review for McAfee Knob. You know, like just things that normally wouldn't get one. Give us your best. Okay. Thank you to our Chuck Norris Award winners on Patreon. That is Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting, Andrew, Austin McDaniel, Austin Ford, Brad and Blair from 13 Adventures, Brent Stenberg, Christopher Marshburn, Coach from Marion Outdoors, Dane, Ish. Derek Cook, Do Good Pantry, Eric Casper, A Friendly Ghost, Eric Hoffman, Greg McDaniel, May he bring honor to his name, Liz Seeger, Matt Sukup, Mike Poizel, Morgan Luke, I am your father, Patrick C. Cialo, Sawyer Products, Timothy Hahn, Solo, and Tracy Trigger. Hans. You can follow us at Backpacker Radio on TikTok and Instagram at Backpacker Pod on X, Facebook.com slash Backpacker Radio. You can follow today's guest at Sarah Tide Walker. You can follow John's. You can find me on Instagram at Juliana underscore Chauncey. And you can get my book, Hiking from Home, a long distance hiking guide for family and friends on Amazon. Appalachian Trials and Pacific Crest Trials are my books. Uh, be sure to follow and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, we're on YouTube. If you guys like the visual version of podcasts, then check us out. You can watch me slouch in my seat. Yeah, and get splashed in the face with water. I I have watched that Instagram post so many times. Yeah. I, I DM'd Sarah during that, during that actual episode, and I was like, this just happened to me. For anyone listening who doesn't follow us on socials, I went to take a sip of my water bottle, which is metal. You can't squeeze it. And I lifted up the straw and it just sprayed me in the face. Um, shout out to 
the Instagram commenter who said, um, what was it? It was something dirty. <laughs> um, of course. It was like, so Chance doesn't swallow or something. This is a guy who's given me tips about Australian shepherds for the past three years. So, like, oh, <laughs> so this is this is who you are. So we've taken um, the friendship to the next level. Yeah, but it's a funny video. I was I was very comforted by the multiple people saying it's happened to them too. Yeah. But yeah, all the reason to watch YouTube. You get all those little fun tidbits yes. that you miss with the radio. Okay, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening and happy hiking. Bye.